Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 55 Live podcast here in conjunction with the WZWA Network. I am the host with the most here tonight, California and Fury. Uh, my co-host Jack Wallace couldn't be here tonight, but that's because he is 22 years old and he has no idea about many things that happened before the year 2000. And I'm <laughs> talking to a guy that did many things before the year 2000 and beyond. And it's somebody that I've been wanting to talk to for some time now because I've been a fan of the tag team he was in, in WCW back in the day. He is one half of disorderly conduct. He is the one and only mean Mike. Hey, brother. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Ready to give you a couple good stories, hopefully. Yeah, cool, man. Uh, I know we've had a bit of a rough run so far tonight getting uh the video and audio working but that's okay yeah um, that's quite slightly but at least we figured it out finally we did um so i guess what i usually like to start the show off with uh me and mike is uh how did you first become a fan of wrestling well i always loved wrestling since i can remember but i wasn't always like obsessed with being a wrestler initially i just watched it on saturday and sunday mornings and when I finally got a tickets to see my first live match, uh, the main event was Nick Bockwinkle versus Rufus R. Jones. That's how long ago this was in the AWA in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, I had always watched just the studio wrestling. You know, there's a couple rows of people. I didn't think it was that. I thought it was cool. But when you go live and you got 12,000 people popping for everything they're doing, at that moment, I was obsessed with it. And at the bus stop with my friend when I was like 11 years old, I said to him, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And from that point on, I was obsessed. That's cool, man. Um, what were we, uh, some of your first shows, I guess, you ever went to in person? It was all AWA. Um, all AWA, I, yep. Yep, in Milwaukee. And uh, my mom used to go every day. The ticket. She worked downtown in Milwaukee, and she would walk over to the arena and get my tickets. We had a set of tickets that we'd watch, and we'd go to the shows and and, um, you know, back then it was Nick Bockwinkle and, and the High Flyers and uh, Jesse Ventura and um, Vern Gagne, Mad Dog Vashon, Baron Van Roschke, all those guys. And, and I was that mark that actually stood on the back of the, the building and I would wait and take pictures of them. I still to this day have the one step camera pictures I took awesome. of all the workers. Yeah. And I actually, the Super Destroyer 3, I was always obsessed with mask guys. And Super Destroyer 3 came in later. And um, one time he left the building and he was standing outside across the street at McDonald's waiting for his ride. And then he walked down the street and me and my friend followed him <laughs> and he took his mask off. And I actually have a picture to this day of him in his car reaching forward like to stop me. And I took a picture of him with his mask off. So that was pretty cool for that age at, at 12 years old. Yeah, man, he could have you could have sold that picture to one of the, the magazines. It, it was just cool to have. I was just so excited I got to see him with his mask off because Super Destroyer 2 at that time I hadn't seen with his mask off. Right. He was kind of my he was my favorite, which was slaughter, Excellent. of course. Yes, of course. Um so you're you're a fan of wrestling when you're in school. Uh, when you leave school, what's your first job that you take? My first what? Your first job. As far as wrestling or just no, job? just just in general. Oh, believe it or not, I was working at McDonald's. Right. And as a breakfast cook. And I was actually wrestling, doing jobs for AWA as Mike Richards at the time. I was like, just had turned 18. Right. So that training. was all at the same time. I wasn't aware of that. Um and, and the strangest thing is, is and I kid you not. One time I wrestled Hogan on the weekend. And then that same morning I was cleaning windows <laughs> at McDonald's. <laughs> and someone looked at me and he goes, are you the guy I just saw on TV? And can you imagine? He was thinking, this guy's working at McDonald's. He was wrestling Hulk Hogan on, on a Sunday morning. And it was, yeah, it was bizarre. That's Very amazing. bizarre. Yeah. Um, so when did you start training and, and who, who was that with? Uh, there was a guy named Rocky Stone, which was an AWA job guy. But he had also traveled the circuits just as a bottom guy and like Kansas city and Louisiana. And then he came back to Milwaukee and, and he was training a lot of us. And, and what happened for me is uh, my mom's boyfriend knew a guy named Herman Schaefer, who was an also native great jobber because uh, he went to the same bar he did. 
and uh, he introduced me to him and that guy got me in to the um, actually getting to train. And then Rocky Stone took over because Herman was like 330 pounds. So he could only teach me so much. He was a great guy and he really went out of his way for me. But he was so big, I needed to learn from someone who actually was more my size. And uh, Stone did the refining with Jake the Milkman Milliman. Uh, do you, have you ever heard of Jake the Milkman? I have not, no. He was an AWA job or two. That's kind of like an icon in this area, in, in the Milwaukee area, Wisconsin, Midwest. Um, but anyways, these guys trained me, bottom line. And, and then Stone had a lot of connections with um, Vern and with WWE because him and Terry Garvin knew each other from Kansas City. So he was basically in charge of hiring the jobbers to go do TV for these guys. And so when I first started, I was Mike Madigan, just doing local shows at the little Fed Hall and these places. And then after about a year, he decided to start bringing me to do TVs. And then we would go do AWA TVs and we'd go do WWE, which was WWF at the time. And uh, as jobbers, and my name was Mike Richards then. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you about this. If you have a story of the first match you ever had. The, the, the what? The first uh, actual match that you ever had. Oh, first match I had was against a guy named Bad Brain Lucas. He was a little Cuban dude. And uh, it was at the Fed Hall. It was November 17th of 1982, which is showing you how old I am. And, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was good. We practiced it for months and it, it was pretty good, but that was my first. And it basically for the first year, I just did like the fed hall, which was in Milwaukee and just kind of local stuff. And then that's like I said, when Tom or Rocky stone said, I think you're ready for TV, but I'll tell you what, I want to do that TV for Vern at that studio that I watched as a kid growing up and then getting in that back and putting on my gear with all these stars and at that time, it was the peak. I mean, it was Hulk Hogan and Crusher Blackwell, and Tony Atlas and Vern and Greg, Jesse Ventura, Adrian Adonis, um, Jimmy Garvin, the Road Warriors. They were all there. Freebirds. Yeah. And I had to wrestle those guys. And it was intense. It was scary. Yeah, I was, I was doing my research earlier today and I um, uh, was seeing just through 1983, you're working with all these guys, Mr. Sado, uh, Jesse Zabisco, Bockwinkle, Kurt Hennig, uh, Bobby Duncan Sr., uh, Stan Hansen, the Road Warriors, King Kong Bundy, John Nord, yeah. uh, Butch Reed. There's just, I was just like, man, this must be so overwhelming for a guy so just y- young in the business. To now he's just straight up working with all the guys, all the, all the big stars. It was intense. And the, the, the coolest one was probably Nick, Nick Bockwinkle, because that was my first match that got me hooked live and and yeah. literally being in the ring and looking at him and thinking to myself i'm in the studio that i grew up in and now i'm getting ready to lock up with nick bockwinkle it was intense um but i loved it and it was funny because you know they would do three tapings in one day so that, that like my first taping i did hulk hogan baron ron Roshke, and mr saito all in wow. one day <laughs> and it's so funny because sometimes you'd be like the second to last match on the first taping and then like the first match on the second one. So like you just got your butt kicked. Yeah. And then 20 minutes later, you're walking out all fresh. Like you're going to do it again. And the people would be like, have not, have you not figured it out yet? Don't keep coming out here. It was crazy. <laughs> and, and, and you did all that for 150 bucks. Right. What was that backstage atmosphere like in the AWA back in those days? It was, um, it, everyone was nice. It was cool. But it, it was really professional. Vern ran a tight ship. I can tell you right now, even like later on when we became the hangman, I've never seen any promoter that ran an old school tight ship like Vern did. He did not play around. You couldn't even speak. They, they wouldn't let any maintenance people in the back, any cleaning people, nothing. And, and they were really, he was all about kayfabe. I mean, to the, literally, I mean, it was amazing how serious he was about it. Um, so it was, it was a professional atmosphere. It was good. But again, just seeing all those stars in one place as a young kid, it was, it was intimidating. Right. Um, so I, I was, was about to ask what Vern Gagne was like to work for, uh, but you've just kind of said it there. I also wanted to ask, you know, what Greg Gagne was like to work for. Greg was cool. And he pretty much ran it later on. Like when we got our break as the hangman, he was the guy who gave us our break. Um, Greg was a lot more chill than Vern was. Um, and like when we would go do the tapings 
at the showboat in Vegas. Vern was never there because he was getting older. It was just Greg running it pretty much. But um, he was cool. Vern would only be, when we were the hangman, he was only there for like the big shows. And one time he pulled us in the shower and he ringed us out for like an hour. I mean, literally, because of just stupid stuff. Like like we were wrestling Scott, Nor- uh, Scott Norton and uh, Noah the Barbarian. Yeah, but You can imagine, and this was at that Battle of the Belts. It was like a big show in Minneapolis. Uh, Flair was there. There was a lot of people there. But anyways, um, when you wrestle those guys, you were fighting for your life. Those guys were brutal. They were cool guys, but they were very stiff and very snug. And and we kept taking them down, trying to get more time in the match so that they wouldn't just keep bumping us around. Yeah. And we got back. Vernon was so mad and said, how can you keep taking these big guys down and blah, blah. And he was yelling at them, too. But literally for an hour in the shower. And we had to go in the shower in case a maintenance person came into the dressing room. <laughs> I mean, that's how serious that guy was. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say I, I'm a little bit annoyed with the internet because I was trying to do my research on you and uh-huh. the information was just really difficult to come by. So I was just, I just haven't been able to pinpoint when you actually first became one half of the Texas hangman or not. Because came someone, Texas hangman? Yeah. Uh, Cause someone has written in a Wikipedia article that, you had only just joined the hangman uh, when you were in WCW later on, but I was thinking it had to be earlier than that. So that's a good it, point. You know, that, that Wikipedia thing actually bothers me because it's incorrect big time. So what, right. as far as the name goes, we were jobbers for um, Vernon WWE every month for, for probably two years. Yeah. Maybe three. And, my original partner, Bull Payne, I don't know, are you familiar with Bull Payne? Yeah. Okay, Bull Payne was the original Texas hangman, and him and I broke in together. He was Rick Gantner, and I was Mike Richards. We were jobbers for Vern and for WWE, and he came up with the hangman gimmick. Yeah. But when he first came up with it, it was just a skinny rope and just a generic K&H mask. And then he said to me, you know, we should do Where did you go? There, Sorry about that. Go. That's okay. I had a fascination with mask guys. So I said, I'll do it in a second. So we started teaming up and it, it was good on the independent scene. And what happened is we presented pictures to Greg and we had to wear masks anyways because we had been jobbers for so long. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so he looked at the pictures. He goes, I like it. He goes, but maybe you guys need to go somewhere else and get a little more seasoning as the hangman. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just starting to realize some massive mistakes on that Wikipedia article, but please continue. Well, it's because my phone rang. Oh, okay, yep. Um, yeah, Is the wi- uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're still going. Okay, so anyway, so long story short, Greg looked at our pictures as the hangman, and we had been doing jobs for so long, so of course we would have to wear masks, but he said maybe you guys should go somewhere and get a little seasoning as the hangman. So he brought in Jerry Lawler and Dundee because they, they, they held the straps for some reason with Vern briefly. They yeah. won them in Tennessee, came up for taping, and they put them with us. And I'm telling you right now, you have to remind me about this later. Tennessee territory has been the biggest curse in me and any hangman life that you could imagine. Right. So we're wrestling Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler on TV, and it's really just about them seeing what we could do to bring us in as the hangman. And during the, before the match, Dundee says he wants to do a monkey flip on me, but he's so short. I go, I don't know if I feel comfortable from you on the mat flipping me over. I've not done that. And he goes, oh, we'll be fine, mate. You know, another Australian. Uh-huh. And uh, he flips me over and I land right on my head. Yeah. So I get knocked out on live ESPN TV. Shit. But I'm still going and I'm flipping around and they're trying to, and needless to say, it was a disaster. But that, but they said we'll still book you. So they brought us down to do TV, and we were all excited, thinking that we drove twelve hours all through the night to get there, thinking that we actually might get a break. But really, they were just bringing us in to be jobbers. This is long before the hangman actually got a push. Right. And we went in there and we wrestled the Rockers, and I was really tight with Marty Jannetty because him and I were in Kansas City together way before I even did anything. And um, they brought us in and they said we're going to do two out of three falls with the Rockers. 
first fall, they're going to take it on 30 seconds. And then second fall, you're going to get to do some stuff. Well, they do the first fall, 30 seconds. And then we're standing in the ring and all of a sudden they go do an interview. And we realize oh. there is no second fall. It was a rip. Oh, that's so rude. We drove 12 hours all night long to do a 30 second job for the rockers. Oh my God. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a rude awakening of how the business can be. And I was kind of pissed at Marty because him and I were in Kansas city territory together for Bob Geigel and we're very tight, but you know, he had to do what he had to do. So anyways, long story short, um, Greg eventually did use us. He, he booked us. And I don't know if you ever, have you ever seen any of the ESPN tapings? Uh, not much, no, but I, I do have plans to really sink my teeth into they, it. At um, some point. They pushed us really strong. I mean, I, we were shocked ourselves. I mean, they pushed us. We only lost one fall to these Tokyo Bullet kids. But besides that, we never lost a match. We were always getting pushed as, against job guys on TV. And it was really, it was, it was a tremendous run. But unfortunately, it was at the end. They did that team challenge series, which was really goofy. And we were part of yeah. Cisco's team. And, you know. I still wait for that payday from that million dollar check that we won when our team won. But uh, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was at the end. So that was, that was it. Once 80 grade closed the run with the 80 grade as the hangman was done. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, work with you on fixing this Wikipedia article because mm -hmm. it couldn't be more incorrect. It's saying that tough Tom and bull Payne were the Texas hangman for years and then Vito Lagrasso was there to fill in after Bull Payne left Puerto Rico or something. And then you just popped in every now and then in WCW. Now I'm finding out it was you and Bull Payne at the beginning. So I'm going to fix this whole thing for you. I have a Wikipedia account. I can do all that. I'm yeah. make sure it's sorted oh, out. That would yet. be awesome. I've been wanting someone to do that forever. So, so Vito is a good friend of mine, yeah. um, but he never hanged. Never. He never wanted to be. He never was. I don't know how that yeah. Um, as Tom goes, Tom was a partner that I chose after Bull and I, which is a long story, and we can go back to that. But um, when Bull and I broke up, he sold me the gear, and wow. I went through a couple partners, and eventually Tom was the one I sat on, and then him and I became disorderly conduct and the hangman again. But that was all after Bull and I. There's only been Bull and I were the first originals, Bull first, then me. And then Tom came later, but there was also a couple partners in between. And one of them that's funny to talk about is I did a Europe tour. Um, and on that tour, the reason I got that tour is because of Johnny. Remember Johnny Grunge from Public Enemy? Yes, of course. Okay, Johnny and I met when I had a WB tryout after Bull and I broke up. And he, we just got along and he goes, hey, give me your number. I might be able to get you booked on a Europe tour. And I'm thinking, yeah, whatever. I got a call from him. He goes, Hey, we can go, but they want to tag team. Can I be your hangman partner for the trip? And I'm like, Hell yeah, because I'd cool. already got the gear. So cool. Johnny Grunge was actually a hangman for just three weeks. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, great. Was cool. I'm a massive great public guy. enemy fan. I'm a massive fan. Yes. I'm a fan I of all the tag teams from that era. That is, it's an, a bunch of unsung heroes there. Uh, all the tag teams from that era really yeah. need to be put in the conversation um, as far as the greats go. Um, I wanted to scale back a little bit before we get back to more hangman talk. Um, just want to huh? see what you thought about things in the AWA when Hogan left for the WWF in December of 83. And a lot of yeah. things were about to be taking place, especially with the infamous WWF talent raid of the AWA in 84, as well as the mid Atlantic Georgia and Florida territories of the NWA. Um, so all of that kind of coincides with one another. What did you think? early in your career seeing all this taking place? It was, it was definitely noticeable. We saw the, the decline of talent, like right off the bat, which kind of actually was good for us because then it kind of let us shine a little more. But, but at the same time, we knew the writing was on the wall. Um, he was bringing in, you know, Wahoo was coming in and uh, Tommy Rich was coming in and all these guys. We were at the showboat doing our tapings um, which is cool. I mean, I got to work with, the, you know, there, there was a lot of, there was a lot going on, but the bottom line is, is that we went to the Rochester and that was the last step was the Rochester tapings. And um, you could just see the talent. Every time you'd come to a taping, there'd be less talent there. <laughs> the writing was on the wall. You knew what was going on. And uh, it was, it was tough. I mean, we, we didn't want it to, to stop. Um, 
but you know, I think every territory was going through that. The ones that were there, and it, it, it was tough. And we were concerned because we were like, "What are we going to do after AWA closes up?" But thank God for Puerto Rico, so it worked mm. out. Right? Yeah, I just think that's just such an interesting and and one of the most biggest sharp turns the business ever had. Um, it was crazy. I wasn't even born yet, but <laughs> I've done my research. I know all the th- all the all the big things. You always do your research, which is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Um, what did you think of Pro Wrestling USA in that attempt? That was cool. I liked it because it was a mixed match of everybody, and it was cool when I got to work with some different guys, and it, it was it was a cool thing. And I think that I think that if the Eagles hadn't been so big, it might have worked. But ultimately, Vince was putting everyone out of business. He's just so good at what he does. And it was, it was, and Vern was so antiquated in his thoughts. You know, I mean, that team challenge series, I don't know if you've seen much of it, but it was such a weird premise. Like keeping points for people's big yeah. win. I saw that like, on the was, date on the DVD that they uh, put out. It was so bad, so bad, you know, and it was cool being, you know, getting the rub from Zabisco and all that. But yeah, it, it was going to happen inevitably, and that, but the Pro Wrestling America was really cool. Cool, man. Um, I, 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 I didn't have this in my questions, but you mentioned him, and I, I, I'm sure you have a Larry Zabisco story. Uh, Larry, Larry is a very good guy, but he is Larry lives in Larry Land. <laughs> and, and, and he's a great guy, but he truly is maybe one of the most full of himself guys I've ever met <laughs> and he's a great worker. I worked him as Mike Richards as a job and he was very good and took care of me. Um, but yeah, Larry's Larry's a very confident individual, um, but he did a lot of things. I mean, let's face it, him and Bruno, 43,000 people at Shea stadium. I mean, I guess you can be a little cocky, right? <laughs> I interviewed Scott Hudson and he told me that Larry still has the payoff from that match. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so this is another part uh, of this interview where, uh, you know, I've got a bit of a problem with uh, what's online about you uh, because from my research, it tells me that you work with uh, the super ninja, AKA Shunji mm-hmm. Ch- Takano. Yeah. So that right. Nine days after I was born on January 24th, 1987. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and, but, before moving on to working on WWF superstars and wrestling challenge by April of 1987. Um, uh-huh. But it seems you were also able to work in both companies through 87. Is that correct? It was awesome. I put several years. Wow. And it was okay. funny because I don't know what it was, but apparently $150 was just the, that was the payday, no matter who you worked for. I don't know if they talked to each other, but you got a buck 50 for either one. Right. And it'd be weird because one weekend I'd be working Greg Valentine Killer Khan, Ming, and then the following weekend I'd be working for Vern and I'd be doing jobs for Tommy Rich and Wahoo, Mr. Saido, um, Stan, Brody. I mean, so it was cool because I was on TV all the time, yeah. you know, but I mean, you get your ass kicked, wasn't that great, but it was still cool. And, uh, but yeah, we would do, I did both for several years and so did Bull. Bull was Rick Antner on there. And we both did jobs and paid our dues big time. So when the hangman thing came, finally came up, we paid our dues on like a lot of these guys today. We, we got our asses kicked. And I'll tell you what, working Brody or working Hanson, you knew you were in a fight. I mean, it, they didn't hurt you to the point where you, you know, you were hurt after the match, but those were ass kickings. They really were. I mean, back then it was a little different than it is now. You, when you did the job for some of these top guys, Freebirds, Road Warriors, they were all super snug. Oh, and I can imagine with Stan Hansen with that eyesight of his, that maybe a few of those clotheslines. Yeah. Have, uh, I, I took the, there's, a, there's a video on YouTube of him to give me that clothesline and <laughs> it looks like he decapitated me, but he was cool. <laughs> he actually let me do a lot. It was so surprising. He was a degree champion at the time. And he actually probably let me do more than most guys do. Cause most times you just get a punch or two in the stomach or whatever. Yeah. He was really cool. Um, so again, my research tells me the first day that you spent in the WWF was against Killer Khan on April 23rd, mm-hmm. 1987. What would you say that and describe to be the differences between the WWF's operation and AWA? I mean, if anyone can make a good comparison, it's somebody that did both companies for the two year stint there. Big difference. Payday the same, but big difference. When you worked for WWE, there was catering. 
When you came there, even at Jobbers, we got to eat all the catering, buffet, all you can eat. Um, agents, endless agents, Tony Garia, Rene Goulet, Chief Jay Strongbow, Arnold Skoland, all these guys were agents. So you're, you're getting contact with all these guys telling you what they want, blah, 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 blah. Um, with Vern, it was just Vern and Greg running it, and there was no buffet, and there was no nothing. You know what I'm saying? It was just you're there to do your job, and that's it. Um, as far as in ring, the rings in WB were much harder, stiffer rings, a little bigger. Um, but the matches for either are usually so short. I mean, you know, they're five, seven minutes. Getting your ass kicked for that amount of time is not that bad. Yeah, you know the only thing I didn't like about working Killer Con is he used to spit that green mist, <laughs> so it was always uncomfortable when I'd come back because you're like walking through and all the boys are there and you got this green face <laughs> and everyone's kind of looking at you like oh geez. you know so it was a little weird knowing that some dude just spit in my face but you you know you do what you got to do. <laughs> um, moving through 1998, uh, sorry 1988, you worked with Demolition, Bad News Brown, Greg Valentine. Ted DiBiase, Haku, Ron Bass, the Rougeaus, Kurt Hennig again. Uh, yep. And that Time. seems to be a running theme with all the big companies. You end up uh, crossing paths with Kurt quite a lot. Do you have any stories about any of those guys or, or, or that time in the WWF? Well, I've got some Kurt stories, but I can't tell them on here. Um, <laughs> Kurt was the best. He was just amazing, funniest dude ever. But uh, I don't really have a lot of stories as far as personal stories because, you know, as a job guy, you really didn't get to spend a lot of time with them on a personal level, just doing jobs. Um, most of the guys were all cool. I honestly, I didn't have any bad experiences with any of them. Later on, I got to know Billy D and Barry much better when I did the hangman and we worked matches. And um, funny story, Barry Darso of Demolition, um, his son, Dakota Darso, was a wrestler for a while with WWE. Yeah. And it didn't work out but he lived here in Tampa area where I am from and I got to know him and I used to be a bouncer at a club down in uh, downtown, like Clearwater beach area. And I got him a job there and he ended up meeting his wife to be, she was a bartender there. And, um, and now they're married and they boom back up to Michigan and they have two kids, but that was all because of me hooking him up with a job. So it kind of changed his whole life. And so wow. whenever I see Barry, he always brings that story up. Because, you know, basically he's a grandpa because of me, kind of, sort of. Right. Um, yeah, so it was pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, as far as personal experiences, I don't really have a lot of them with them. I can tell you there was a couple guys that weren't so nice. Rick Rude. I mean, I, I don't like to talk about some of his past, but he was a little rough and not very nice at times. Um, but besides him, I can't really think of anyone that was not cool. I got a good yeah. story, though, if you want to hear about the boss man. Oh, sure. I love the boss man. So the boss man, he was doing that Bubba thing in W or NWA at the time, I think. Yeah. I was his tryout match. And the reason, they, whenever someone would have a tryout match, they, usually they would try to find someone that was one of the better jobbers because they want someone who's going to do good for them. Yeah. And so I got picked and I was his tryout match. It was somewhere in Connecticut or somewhere over on the East Coast. And um, he came out and it was with him and Slick. It was his first match with WWE. They were just trying it out with the whole security outfit and all that. And, and uh I put him over like a million bucks. And when I got back, he was so thrilled. He was like, thank you, brother. And they ended up hiring him. Um, guess what I got for it? And I, I mean, and he was so great, but he was rough because he was trying to get a job. I got an extra 25 bucks for a bonus. Fantastic. <laughs> but it was still cool because he was a great guy. And yeah, it was a trial match. And he got, oh. he got hired. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, I've always been a big fan of his. Um, I remember like years later, uh, when I first became a fan of wrestling, um, I was like, I know that this isn't, this isn't the real deal, but when, right. when the boss man and when Scott Steiner wrestle, they're the only ones they're allowed to be real for whatever reason in my like 12 year old head, I believe the boss man and Steiner, just those cool. two were the only ones that are allowed to be real. So like they, I totally had a few of those too. <laughs> they totally tricked me. Uh, that, that, that were that good. Um, so uh, speaking of Kurt Hennig, I have to ask if you ever were witness to him pulling any ribs. If I ever what? Uh, if you ever witnessed him pulling any ribs on anybody. I actually witnessed him pulling a major rib on one of my friends and I stopped it. God's <laughs> honest truth. Yeah. Kurt, Jimmy Snooker, 
Scott Hall. This is an AWA when I was a jobber, Mike Richards. Um, Scott, Kurt, Snooker, maybe Brian Knox. We all went out to a bar after the show in Milwaukee. And I had a friend of mine named, he, he wrestled as Billy Bold Eagle. His name was Chad. And he worked at Sears as a job. But he did jobs like all of us. We all had jobs. Anyways, long story short, we're out at the bar. And they keep feeding him drinks. And I know something's up. And I'm with Frank DeFalco, a friend of mine, too. And we're watching them. And I'm like, man, something ain't right. They just keep feeding him drinks. They're putting him over like he's one of the boys, blah, 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 blah. Well, at the end of the night, they go back to the hotel. And they say, Chad, you got to come with us. So they bring him in the hotel, hotel room with them. And me and Frankie leave because we all have jobs in the morning. And so did Chad. He had to be up at 6 a.m. Yeah. And it's like probably one. We knock on the door. And they open the door. They were about to shave his damn eyebrows. <laughs> he would have had to go to work at Sears with no eyebrows. Because <laughs> they did that all the time. Yeah. And uh, thank God, you know, we both got in there. We're like, listen, you guys can't do this. And Scott Hall, of course, is like, oh, come on, dude. You're breaking up the party. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> that boy, this is our buddy. You know, and we took him out. And to this day, he's always thanked us for that. So, yeah. But those guys were huge rivers. I remember Marty told me one time that uh, when he was in KC, I guess the uh, him and Sean roomed with the Nasty Boys. They had like a apartment. Yeah. And Kurt came there to hang out with them, and he took his shit <clears throat> in a cup, and then he put it in the back of their their cabinet where all the other cups are, so they didn't know where it was, <laughs> <laughs> and it smelled like shit for like weeks. And they couldn't figure <laughs> out where it was coming from because he stuffed it in the back of the other cups <laughs> that's good. that's good stuff oh that stuff doesn't happen anymore i'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, those were the days i wish i could tell you one story but this one i couldn't but yeah he got me oh, yeah. he was amazing he was one of the best rivers ever but you know what he was so cool and such a just a great person i mean when he passed it, it really hit a lot of us hard because he was just such a good dude and he was always so nice to everybody and that guy could work his ass off absolutely he's got to be in my top 10 um, yes always has been always been a massive fan of his I'm glad he got to run as champion in awa he deserved it me too yeah he, he deserved to be champion elsewhere too um true that so i want to ask a little bit more about the texas hangman unfortunately i don't have as many questions that i as i would have had uh had i not been tricked by the internet <clears throat> to believing that Tough Tom was the brains behind the operation. The right, 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 right. Um, so just tell me a little bit more about, you know, the, the the highs and lows of being in the Texas Hangman. Okay. So after Vern closed, and I'll try to keep this brief, um, I sent a tape, that's how old it was, I sent a VHS tape of our best matches for Vern down to Puerto Rico. Yeah. Not thinking I'm ever going to hear anything back. And I get a call two weeks later on my answering machine. That's how long ago this was from jose gonzalez the invader yeah which of course we know what he's famous for mm -hmm. and he's like amigo uh we saw your tape and we were very we've seen you on tv da 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 because espn went all over and he goes we'd like to bring you in for a couple of weeks we're, we're definitely interested i'd like to shoot a big angle with you guys so i'm like wow so i contact bull and both of us had full-time jobs at the time but we're like let's go so we went down there we i called him back and we went down there for two weeks and the strangest thing is, is the last match on the two weeks, we were working the Super Medicos. One of them was Jose Estrada, and then it was his kid. They wore white masks. And uh, they gave us the straps. All right. I'm thinking, why would you give us the straps when we're only in here for two weeks? And we didn't even really want, we didn't really want to be there because it was kind of a rough trip. We had like, you know, down in Puerto Rico, that's a, it's a great territory. I mean, I, some of the best memories of my life are from there, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of the boys get caught up in a lot of bad stuff because there's so much drugs and access to stuff. Mm -hmm. And like Ron Starr, rest in peace. He was so about just getting drugs. He goes, Oh, I'll, I'll drive you guys to all the towns. Cause we didn't know where they were like, okay, but we didn't know that the reason you wanted to drive us to the town. So was that after the matches, he could slip through the barrio and get what he needed Right. You know, and, you know, it was it was intense. But bottom line is, is that they gave us the straps. Um, we went home. And then they called us back like a week later and they're like, hey, amigo, we got a starting date for you. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, we got jobs. 
you know, we can't just quit our jobs and come down there. And we ended up negotiating it where they gave us a thousand a week, which at that time was a decent amount of money. It was a thousand a week guarantee. And um, they brought us in and we both quit our jobs. Frank had bull pain, Frank. He had a wife. His wife realized that this is our dream. We went down there and we had a hell of a run. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen any of our videos, but on, on YouTube, but we we actually packed the house and we did an angle where we hung the invader and he actually went to the hospital for 10 days and did the whole deal. And the people bought into it and they switched TNT from, which was Savio Vega. They switched yeah. him from here to a face to save him. And it drew big money. And it was, it was a wow. great time. I love my time in Puerto Rico. It was tremendous. Wow. I can only imagine the, uh, the, the, cause I've, I've just, from what I've seen over the years, the, the, the fans in Puerto Rico are quite, crazy they're, I know, I know they're Rick Flair's told some stories and you yeah. hanging one of the guys i mean they'd be out for blood it it, it was so insane and, and we had so much heat and i'm not even exaggerating there were times that we twice we had to be taken out by the police because the fans were literally breaking into our dressing room and it was we were in there and Dickie Murdoch was in there and Buddy Landell and all of us. We were just ready to go because we think we're going to be fighting soon. And then the police would show up. And we'd have to go out the back door in a paddy wagon. And then they'd bring us back after all the fans leave. I had um, a dart thrown into my back. I've had piss thrown on me. I've had uh, batteries thrown on me. I, I got hit in the face one time with a, with, a, with a hard ball right in my eye socket. And somehow it didn't break my eye socket. But it was brutal. It was brutal. I mean, these fans were nuts. But we loved it. It was cool. And uh, that's a story to, to anyone out there wrestling today in, in the wrestling world. If you think that you're over as a heel, think again. That's over as a heel. <laughs> it's, yeah, it'll sadly never be like that again. The fans, it's so exposed today. But it was, it was as real as it could be to those fans. I mean, we never had this happen. But prior to us, there were guys that even got their cars put on fire. Oh we never God. had that. But guys, yeah. Like, you know, years before that, it was. It was in insane territory. Um, I want to do a little bit of fact or fiction uh, here. And you've already kind of touched on this earlier, but um, <laughs> the Wikipedia article on the Texas hangman could not be any more incorrect. So it, it says that our uh, bull pain um, split because him and Carlos Colon fought over his salary. And so Vito Lagrasso replaced him for the remainder of the team's reign could be farther from the truth here's what happened um bull and i had our run with them yeah and then eventually they said um we can't keep paying you a thousand dollars and here's a sad thing like we were getting a thousand a week and they knew that if they didn't pay us a thousand a week we were leaving because we didn't mind going back and getting normal jobs but the guys like rick valentine carrie brown and uh, Eric Embry and a lot of these guys, they that's all they knew. So they would short those guys on their paydays all the time. They'd come in the, in the, in the dressing room on Friday nights with this big fat envelope for us. And a lot of these guys would just be able to get in advance. It was a tough territory if you weren't over. And um, bottom line is, is eventually though, they did come up to us and say, we got called in the office and they said, we're not going to be able to pay you a thousand dollars anymore, but we want you to stay. And we had already dropped the straps to Bronco and Invader. And we talked about it and we're like, you know what? We're just going to end up being like the rest of these guys. Let's not do it. And Eric Embry at that time had already left. And he was now booking for USWA. And he told us on the way out, he said, listen, if you guys are ever ready to leave Puerto Rico, call me and I'll get you booked in USWA, which was Lawler's territory. And um, so that's what we did. I called him from a payphone outside the dial. You can't say where Eddie Gilbert died. We all stayed there and um, talked to Eric and he gave us a starting date. But there was nothing to do with Vito. Had, that's all just crap. Don't know. I don't know who this bloke is that that made this Wikipedia article. But uh, it, it's a, it's a shame because it's so false. It's so false, and I've been wanting to get changed forever. But I'm know. I'm your man. I I am your man, Carl. Gonna, you're the best. I'm gonna get on. The, I'm gonna get on it tomorrow. And it also says that Tom was mighty Kodiak, and I was mighty Kodiak. <laughs> They're giving, Which I'm Tom, sure you're they're giving Tom too much credit here. <laughs> I, big time. I was the one who picked Tom, which I will get into later. But yeah, the Bull, Bull and I were the originals. And when we split up in USWA, I don't know if you want to get into that or not, but that's yeah, what we sure. split up. Talk about USWA. I mean, uh... Okay. 
So yeah. what happens? We don't is get many people of, on the show that uh, have, have been through this. So. Yeah. So, uh, so we, um, after Puerto Rico, we just, like I said, we decided to leave and we went to USWA. Well, we didn't realize that that territory doesn't pay shit. We never even really asked about paydays. We just were happy to go somewhere else to keep working. So we go to USWA and you have to listen to the schedule. <laughs> okay. Now keep in mind, when we were in Puerto Rico, we were working five days a week. It was basically a territory where you had off on Mondays and Tuesdays in Puerto Rico. And the rest, but, but all the towns, because Puerto Rico is only like 150 miles wide, you could leave at 6.30 at night, you'd be home by midnight. Great territory. And you, and you live right near the beach. So we go to USWA, now we're living in a shithole hotel that all the boys stay at called the Scottish Inn. And it's me and Bull there. And then down the street from us is another place called the Congress Inn. And you got Tom Pritchard and Stone Cold, Steve Austin there. Yeah. And we're all starving. And the week would start on Monday and you'd wrestle in Memphis. Then the next day you'd be in Louisville at the gardens. Then the next day you'd be in Evansville, Indiana. And then after the show on, in, on Wednesday, you'd take your car and you'd meet wherever they told you to meet and you'd hop on a tour bus. Oh no, no, no. That Wednesday you would do, you do Evansville. Then you would do a spot show on Thursday. After the spot show on Thursday, you would meet and we'd hop on a tour bus. We would drive all night long for like 12 to 14 hours all the way to Dallas. It'd be me, all the baby faces, Stone Cold was there, Tom Pritchard. We were all on this bus and we would drive all the way to Dallas to the Sportatorium to do the ESPN show. And then we'd say we'd be at the Sportatorium. We'd get to like noon. And we'd have nothing to do until the show at night. And then you'd do the show and then you'd hop back on that tour bus you drive all the way back to Memphis, do morning TV in Memphis. Then after the morning TV in Memphis, you would drive to Nashville, which is where we lived, and we would do the Saturday night show. And then you'd have off on Sundays and you'd start it all over again. Right. And we did that for $300. <laughs> oh my God. And we were champions. And we were the champs. <laughs> That's how paying, bad it was. Paying your G's in the starving. wrestling business right there. We were all starving. I remember Stone Cold Steve, he would cook a big pot of potatoes and he would literally eat off yeah. the potatoes for the whole Yeah. I remember him talking about that just raw potato. It's a true just story. Boiled, just boiled potato. Um, there's some another thing. I want to see fact or fiction if this is true. My research tells me that you went to Japan in late 96 yep. to early 97 under the name of Juice for Big Japan Pro Wrestling. Is that correct? No, that's wrong too. Oh my God. Okay. That's Tom again. <laughs> so what Tom happened Tom. is, is um, when we were in Puerto Rico, there was a guy named Victor Quinones and he used to book for Japan and he liked us a lot and he booked me and I used to wrestle there as the hangman. Initially, it was the hangman. It was just Tom and I as the hangman. But then eventually, it evolved to Big Japan for Kojika, where they wanted monster gimmicks. And I wrestled as Gray Skull as a monster. Oh, you so you big. were Gray Skull? Okay. I, I was Gray Skull. Down. Okay, yeah. And I had a big. I, I came up with this. I still have. It's right in front of me, actually, on my bookcase. I had a big mask uh, with a big mohawk and all that, and I was kind of the most over the monster gimmicks despite what anyone says. And then it was Juicy, which was Tom. And they called him Tornado Juicy, actually, which was really weird. But he had like a Metallica mask and of the, that, or Iron Maiden, the, the mask that the Iron Maiden thing had. And then yeah. um, I got I got bull booked too, because we were all tight. I got bull booked as uh, the Jester. So we all did the monster gimmicks for years, but I also did the Hangman there too for a lot of time. Most of the time was Hangman, and there was also the monster gimmick. But I wanted to go back a second if we could um, yeah. about the hang split. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. But what happened is um, in USWA, my partner Bull met a girl. And it's, I don't want to get too deep into it, but bottom line is, is that it was Jamie Dundee's girl who was our manager, JC Ice. Yeah. And he had, he had invited us over for like a cookout one day and then him and or her and Bull met and eventually it evolved and, and, and they weren't doing good. JC and her weren't doing good. Her name was Donna and they met and, and Bull fell in love with her, even though he had been married, but that marriage was falling apart because we were on the road all the time. Long story short, 
Bull decided when we got our note, we got our notice from WCW or USWA because Bull and her were dating and that didn't go well with the office because okay. JC obviously didn't like that, Jamie, and it became a big issue. So we got our notice. So we had to leave. Yeah. And so what happened is, is when I came back to Milwaukee, Bull stayed there. He divorced his wife. He got together with Donna. And they became Bull Payne and Samantha Payne. Are you familiar with them? No, only him. Okay, they won that. They won that global wrestling thing or whatever on ESPN. But he became, she became his valet. Long story short, I came back to Milwaukee. He sold me the gear, and I started trying to find partners. And I, I went through two different partners before Tom. I had a guy named George who was the spy master up in Milwaukee, and him and I did it. And him and I had grew up, grew, grew up together, and I had trained him. And then I had another friend of mine named Rambo Robinson that I also trained, and both those guys were good, but it just didn't work out. And then I picked Tom and that's how we became the hangman. And then from that point on, it was Tom and I as the hangman and Bull was okay. doing his own thing as Bull Payne. Okay. Yeah. Because man, I'm getting real, I'm getting real pissed off now because it's saying that, that you were juice and Tom was gray skull. Yeah. It, 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 and then again, Fuck. it says that he was the Kodiak. And, and, and what happened is for me, long story short is, this is later on, but Tom and I eventually went back to Puerto Rico. And then later on, I wanted to go back by myself, but I took the mask off and I, not that nobody knew there, but I, became, I gained some weight and I became Kodiak with a big bear on my head. Right. Yeah. And I had run against Carlos and um, it wasn't Tom. Tom also, I got him booked there as Blackjack Bennett singly, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just insane. It's, it's so far off. You couldn't even wow, thank you. Yeah, Carl, you know, I'm looking forward to you correcting this. Uh, and it also, there's another website called cagematch.net that said that you were Black Jack Bennett. <laughs> no, Tom is Black Jack oh Bennett. Oh my God, they, got they've, got, they've got you both mixed up so bad on both these websites, cagematch.net yeah, and Wikipedia. I will email and, cagematch.net. And when I'll he did the Black Jack Bennett gimmick, he was kind of a bottom guy there, but, he, but you know, he was still paying his dues because when I brought him in as a hangman, he had just been a job guy at AWA and all that, and I saw potential in him and I knew he was good. And so I had him come in for like a tryout at, in Milwaukee where I'm from at, at my ring. And I, cause I had a school and um, I liked him. And, and from that point on, it was Tom and I, Tom right. and I only, but I got, a, I got another story if I could about Puerto Rico. Go for it. When Tom and I came in, if you want to hear it, I don't know. Yeah. Are we at that point? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's cool. Go for it. Well, Tom and I later on after Bull and I, we went to, Puerto Rico was the hangman. They gave us the straps again, but the same. Now we weren't making a thousand a week at that time. It was kind of like, on average, seven eight hundred bucks a week. But we were fine with that. Um, but then they started to fall behind a little bit. This is the weirdest story ever. So finally, we were behind like two weeks, and we were going to Japan for Victor Quinones all as the hangman. And I said to Carlos, I said, Carlos, if you don't get us caught up. I'm not bringing the strap back because we yep. need to have something to negotiate with you on. And he goes, no, we'll get you caught up. Well, they never did. So we went to Japan and then I stopped home for a couple of days in Milwaukee. And then when we went back to Puerto Rico, I didn't bring the strap and we had title defenses. And he goes, Amigo, where's the strap? I go, I told you I'm not bringing it. You got to get us caught up. He goes, all right, well, we'll get you caught up. Well, they never got us caught up. So eventually they had us drop the straps to Ricky Santana. And I don't even know who, but I never, the strap back <laughs> you still got it now. so to this day now i painted it red because it matches the hangman thing but to this can you see that oh. <laughs> amazing yes i can and this is actually the strap that they had had forever so this was probably held by bro i don't even i can't even imagine who's all held the strap but tom and i both have one he's got one at his house up in sheboygan and i got one here but yeah they never paid us and so you would think that that would end our relationship a couple of years later, I call him back and say, I want to come in as Kodiak. I come in. They've got new straps. It's never brought up. Go figure. <laughs> That's a nice little memento to keep there when you guys I love are the it, champs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I, I'd take that $800 loss for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, tell me about your experience in Japan. Uh, obviously, everything that I've got written down here is what Tom did and not what you yeah. did. So, yeah, tell me what you did over there. Well, him and I almost always went together, either as the Hangman or as Ray Skull and Tornado Juicy, and Bull was there a lot, too. Um, it was great. I expected when I went to Japan, I thought it was going to be, from what I had seen or heard, 
It's going to be like this really snug. But we were not in all Japan or New Japan. Had we been there, it might have been different. But in Big Japan and IWA, to be honest with you, I was kind of surprised. I mean, everyone was good, but the guys weren't very physical, like Tarzan Goto and um, Masanuga and all those guys. They were they were great. They actually kind of complained about how snug we were. I mean, I like working snug. I always like working snug. And these guys weren't really about that. It was really kind of an easy territory. I mean, really easy. I mean, you got traded. The, the, the drives were long. Um, you know, you get picked up in the morning at the with the bus, and you all have to hop on the bus and go. And, and you never knew where you were even going. Um, but you'd be there for like three weeks, and you just hop on the bus and go where you're going and come back. And some of the arenas back then didn't even have uh, heat, so you'd be you'd go there and it'd be freezing cold, and you'd have to wear your jacket, and there'd be like a space heater in the dressing room, and then you'd go out and do your match. You could see your breath. I mean, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever have to do any of those no rope barbed wire matches or barbed wire yep. board matches? Oh yeah. Yeah, many of them. There was uh there's a video on YouTube of us with uh what was his name? Funaki. I can't remember his name, but yeah, we did a match that was brutal and it was a barbed wire bat match where they counted to ten and then you ran in and grabbed the bat and all that, and then we brought a ladder into the match and it was hard to and, and do you want to hear a good story about cactus and Terry Funk? Yeah, man. All right. Uh -oh. Let me grab my drink here. So um, the one tour we were on, Cactus and Terry Funk were the top two guys. And you can see this match on video. So Cactus and Terry are working in the main event. And it was the one where they did the barbed wire. And Cactus Mick tried to do that flip where he catches himself in the ropes, but it was yeah. barbed wire. Yeah. And he literally sliced all his fingers like hot dogs where they're busted open like they were overcooked oh my god and i was at ringside because cactus asked mick asked me before the match he goes hey can you come out and wear my jacket and he had this long jacket with like tassels so you see on the video on youtube me with my mask on and i was his second because he wanted me to hold his wallet because you never know what's going to happen when you're in the ring yeah so i've got his wallet in my coat in his coat and he does this match and he does this flip and his hands are so split open that you couldn't even believe how gross it was. And they wrestled these two guys, beat the crap out of each other in front of maybe 500 fans. But those guys were, they were just hardcore veterans. And um, the next day we had to fly out. So we're at the airport at 6 a.m. Cactus literally has his hands gauzed up. Oh my God. Both sides. And his blood actually coming through on the palms because he was so bloody and beat up. <laughs> and Tom goes, hey, hey, Mick, you look like Jesus. Because he had his hair all fucked up. And <laughs> he, goes, he goes, my wife is going to kill me. He had to fly home. And, and, and it, was, it was unbelievable. I, I'm so, to this day, they wouldn't let him on the plane. He literally no was way. bleeding. Hands and he had gauze because he had gigged himself so bad he just put yeah. gauze all over and he had like hair sticking out but anyways long story short they wrestled um we had a we had a, a lot of good runs i probably did like 10 tours there between the two companies um it's great it was just it, it, the people in japan are so respectful sometimes the crowds weren't that big because it was a smaller promotion but they always paid us the karaoke and hall was a very iconic place to, i i i got lucky i got to wrestle at the sportatorium Dallas. I got to wrestle the Brokeen Hall. I mean, I got to do some pretty cool buildings. So I was, I was thankful. It was cool. Oh, that's cool, man. Um, I'm really enjoying this interview, by the way. This is some very, uh, I always, I, I find that, um, you know, all the podcasts that go around, it's always like, you know, Kurt Angle or Stone Cold or, you know, the, very tippy top guys that people yeah. interview, but some of the, you know, some of the other Lenny Lane was one of my favorite interviews I ever had. Great. I watched it. I loved it. Some of these other guys, Lodi again, another great yeah. interview. These guys don't, and yourself need to be put in the spotlight because there's so many great stories to be told. I just wanted to put that oh, out there. I appreciate that. I don't think a lot of people realize that a lot of us, even though we didn't have the big run in the big companies, we did a lot of stuff before that, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, we're not even to WCW yet, but all that stuff I did, but yeah, we did the, the Japan thing. And then it was always Tom and I, after that, I don't know where all this Wikipedia stuff comes from. And then what happened is, um, do you remember the AWF? 
Um, the AWF. See, the, I, we have an AWF in Australia, so um, this this one was um it was it was uh, a national product, and it was a guy named um what was his name Paul something or another. He passed away now. He was a rich guy, and he basically just wanted to be in the business, and he started this big company, and um, hired all these guys and gave them astronomical paydays and all that. And he basically ended up broke at the end. But bottom line is, it's just AWF. Um, Paul Terry Ol- Olpustein. Yes. Yes. Wikipedia and, was uh, correct this time. <laughs> that's amazing. The reason he liked us so much is because in Windy City Wrestling, he was our manager when he first got a break. So he wanted us part of this to begin with. Yeah. So he brought us in and we were a main part of the AWF and it was filmed like in this digital thing at the time. It was very different. But bottom line is, is that it didn't work out, but we did that. And Terry Taylor was one of the main guys in that company. Okay, uh, yep. Mick Carter was one of the announcers and he was great, but Terry Taylor was the main guy, one of the main guys. Well, Terry and I, he liked us as the hangman. Yeah. And back then we worked like Tony Ellis and Coco Beware or Charlie Norris and whatever partner he had. And it wasn't like big, big name. Oh, Barry Darso was an agent at the time for them. Um, so Terry was, Terry was our liaison to get in a WCW eventually. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, I've, I, I just pulled it up then about the AWF. Um, I'll have to do a deep dive on that and learn a bit more about that. There was actually a lot of talent in there. They had the Road Warriors. I mean, they had a lot of guys. I mean, the yes. Shane Twins were there. A lot of decent talent, but... So Tito Santana was their final champion? He was, yes. He was one of the main guys as well, yep. But it just it just wasn't... Um, it wasn't ran very well because he wasn't a business guy. He was a business guy, but he wasn't a wrestling guy, and they took advantage of him. And honestly, they just basically leaked all the money out of him, and he eventually died broke, and he had wow. been a millionaire. So it's a sad situation, that but sad, um, yeah. but thank goodness for that. It kind of gave us the WCW break, you know? Cool, man. And that's actually exactly where I was up to right now. Uh, so Terry Taylor helps you get in there. Uh, you get a call to do a, a Nitro no, debut? What, or It wasn't like that. What happened is – um. I was, I had moved to Florida. I had, you know, I was in Milwaukee most of my life, but I had moved to Tampa, uh, Clearwater, Florida. And Tom was still up in Wisconsin. And I knew WCW did their tapings in Orlando for the worldwide or whatever they were called. Yeah. And I emailed Terry because I got his email from somebody. And I said, Hey, I live in Tampa or this area and Tom's here, but we, I can get him here if you'll use us. And he goes, Oh, I loved you guys. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Come this week. So we, like two weeks later, we were booked for worldwide tapings. Okay. So Tom on his own ticket on his own cost flies down. We drive over to Orlando, which is 90 minutes and we do the tapings. And the first match I have is against Hugh Morris. Um, you know, Hugh Morris, of course. Yeah. So I wrestle Hugh, build him up. Great guy. Yeah. And I've been around a long time at this point, but apparently nobody there knew who we were though. So I do the match and, and it used to be at the, at those tapings, there was a big, like a big trailer out back that would have all the cameras on it. And then you'd have like Arn and all these other people that fit or whoever doing like, Hey, let's go home type thing in, yeah. in there. So I, I, so I do the match with Hugh and we kill it. It's on YouTube. Great match. I mean, it was really good. Not put myself over, but it was really good. And uh, Arn calls me into the thing and he goes, Hey man, he goes, you're a hell of a hand. I was, Who are you? Where you been? <laughs> like, I've been around a long time, but mostly territories, you know? And, and by the way, I went to the Kansas City territory too, which I would like to talk about eventually. That was my first territory back sure. in '83. Okay. For Bob, Mike. but anyways, so um, he says, "Man, you're really good." He goes, "I want to put you with Steve McMichael because we need to get a good match out of him because we have a pay per view coming up. See if you can get a match out of him like you like you just did." With he, but Bill was great. I didn't have to do much with him as far as just I spoke back and forth. And but with Steve McMichael, he was very green, very intense poked up most of the time but anyways um so they put me with steve mcmichael and for whatever reason i pulled off a really really good match with him well that's rare which was great yeah mm. so then um uh, one of the armstrongs comes up when he was the agent i think it was brad or no, it wasn't brad it was either scott i'm not sure who it was but one of the armstrongs comes up and says hey man you're not gonna believe this now this is our first weekend in he goes they want you to come to nitro to wrestle Steve McMichael and Chris Benoit because of this pay-per-view and you had such a good match with them. 
And he goes, I'm not saying nothing, dude. He goes, but I've never seen two guys who just came in get a booking on Lab Nitro. Because I think if you guys do good, you're going to get a job. Awesome. We're, we're like, what? So we're thrilled. So they bring us into Nitro, which I'm – did you see that match with Benoit and McMichael? I've seen YouTube? it, yeah. Yep. All right. So if you watch it again, here's what happened. Okay. So me and McMichael had such a good match – Three days before, but he was so intense for, for Nitro. We go out there, and the finish is supposed to be they throw us together, and then we pirouette out, and Chris grabs the cross face, and he grabs the pile driver thing and gives me the deal. And then yeah. they pin us together, submission, blah, blah, blah. Well, the referee says go home, and the match has been going pretty good prior to that. And when they go to throw us together, when the referee says go home, Michael panics, and he pulls me. Instead of throwing us together, he pulls me towards him. <sighs> Starts trying to do the pile driver, which you'll see. And then he starts, I'm not ready. So when he yeah. goes to pick me up, we're dancing around and we're falling all over oh the place. God. And finally he drops me and it's just the shits. So he fucked it up. And because of that, we didn't get a job. So you got blamed because the green. Well, they didn't blame player. us. They could have known he did it, but they didn't get the result. they wanted. Right. So when we came back, I saw Terry's face and I was Shit. like, and I knew, and, and they still use us after that, but they didn't put us under contract. And I don't, I think had that gone the way it should have gone, I think the hangman or disorderly conduct or whatever, it would have been a whole different story, but it just wasn't wow. meant to be. And it is what it is. And, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest regrets I have. Right. Well, how about this? We'll, we'll cut off WCW right there and we'll go to Kansas City now and talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. I did not have that in my notes. So then we'll come back to WCW when. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So, so yeah. the city, it, I, I, at that time, I was just doing the Mike Madigan local indies, and Rocky Stone said to me, I think you need to go out and get some experience. And so, what he did what, what, before that, though, he took us to a taping for the Kansas City TV, and it was a taping where they were doing this big show at the Kemper Arena. And somebody didn't show up and Art Cruz needed an opponent and they, Bob Geigel asked Stone, who's your best guy? And it was me. And he says, this guy put me in there with Art Cruz. I'd never been to heel before, pulled off a great match. And Bob said to Stone, he goes, hey, if you, that kid ever wants to come in, get a hold of me. So I called him as I came in, but I wasn't ready. I just happened to pull off a great match that night. I was not ready. Yeah. So I come in there and it's another $300 a week territory. And I wrestled Luke Graham and TG Stone and uh, Gypsy Joe. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Grapplers, people like that. Uh, Len Denton, the Grappler, was booking at the time. And uh, Marty and I became really good friends because he was teaming with a guy named Tommy Rogers, who was really Tommy Lane of the RPMs. Are you familiar with them? I know Tommy Rogers, yeah. But I don't know that. No, term. not Tommy Rogers, the one who passed, the one that was... Tommy Lane, they were part of a team called the RPMs. Oh, okay. No, I've not heard of them, no. Okay. Well, anyways, that Tommy Lane, who was at the time calling himself Tommy Rogers, not the one from the Fantastics. Okay. They were the tag team champions. It's called the Uptown Boys. And it was Marty and Tommy. But they didn't like each other. So Tommy drove with Buzz Tyler, and then Marty drove with me. And we became really, really good friends and um, traveled the territory so the only good thing that came out of kansas city was marty because my first match in was gypsy joe are you familiar with him at all oh i've i've, I've seen a few things about him yeah he, he, he was like the oldest wrestler old, in the world at one stage stiffest old prick you can imagine but a good guy <laughs> beat the shit out of me to the point where my chest was bleeding from his chops and it's funny be right before i went into the ring and i had just met harley harley pulled me aside because he was a good guy he said hey kid mm -hmm. Gypsy Joe is going to chop you up really good. He goes, those chops are going to hurt. And I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I, I've had chops from Wahoo. He goes, no, this is different. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I didn't know what he was talking about until I got in there. <laughs> this guy chopped me and he, he was taking my hair and headbutting me so hard and holding my hair that my forehead was bruised so bad I couldn't even touch my head. Wow. He beat the shit up. Yeah. So needless to say, I didn't get over in Kansas City. That was my first <laughs> match, which his first match in. So I was only there for maybe six months, but it was cool to do and all that. But the good thing that came out of it was Marty and I were good friends from that on. And then we've always been good friends. And actually this room right here, which is my office for my appraisal business, 
this was his bedroom because him and I lived together later on, which is another whole story, but him and I lived together and he, this was his bedroom and right where I'm sitting, actually, there was a lot of stuff that happened in that bed that was there. At the time. <laughs> I can't go into that either. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, yeah, that was a crazy I've had. No, that's cool, man. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's, um, you know, a little bit of a Gypsy Joe name drop. Yeah, I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize I even was in Kansas City. Um, but as far as the WCW thing goes, so basically what happened is is they um, they didn't hire us under contract after the debacle with Michael McMichaels, but they did use us, and we would get like um, 250 to 300 a night, and they would just we'd have to call in and listen to the tape thing to see if we were on, and we'd do these tapings. And then this, it just shows you how unorganized this company is. Um Remember Kurt Henning when he was doing that thing with Barry Windham and all that it was called Rapper's Crap uh, and all the that? West Texas Rednecks, yeah. Yes. I know you'd know because you, you've got everything in WCW archive. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for whatever reason, they had us booked on a, on a thunder against Kurt and Barry. And they called us and said, hey, we got you booked. And I said, well, we actually have an indie booking because we weren't under contract. We actually have an indie booking that night in Illinois. And they're like, well, we have to be there. We already sent the stuff to production and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, we're not under contract. Mm. Find somebody else. We appreciate it, but I'm not going to cancel this booking. We were, we were supposed to wrestle the Bushwhackers in the main event on the indie show. All right. So she says, let me call you back in a little while. So okay. she calls me back and she goes, hey, if you guys show up, all I can say is it's probably going to be in your best benefits. And I'm like, wow, are they going to give us a contract? So I called Tom. He goes, let's go. So I called the promoter. He was cool about it. He goes, hey, guys, you guys deserve this. So we didn't show up for that thing. We did the TV taping. They gave us a contract uh, only because they had it already sent to production. You couldn't have changed that. <laughs> but we got a we got a contract that for the next four years we were on, and it was great. But the point being is, is we only got that because of their being unorganized and not wanting to send something else besides us. Did we really need to be the guys that did your job for those guys? Yeah, I could have grabbed. So I could have given the Vianos. Could have something. been anybody. <laughs> yeah, could have uh, been anybody. Um, but thank God. So I wanted to talk about um, WCW Saturday Night because this is kind of the home of disorderly conduct. Uh, the first Saturday Night taping that you guys were a part of that I saw was uh, Colorado Springs against Conan and six. Um, but I wanted to ask how long was it until it's decided no Texas hangman disorderly conduct is going to be the new team. Whose idea was this? How did this come about? Good question. So what happened is, is they didn't want us to do the hangman anymore because of the whole, I mean, I get it. The hangman premise. It's not exactly today. It would never fly. No. Um, Terry comes up to us and says, listen, we want you guys to work also without the mask. We're still going to use you with the mask, but we're going to call you the outlaws because there's too much controversy with this hangman. Of course, thing. yeah. We're going to call you the outlaws, but we also want you to come up with another game without the mask. He says, so this is just how shows you how unorganized things where he goes. So pick out like five or 10 names, figure it out and get back to me on the next taping. So Tom and I kind of figured out and looking back, I would have picked something better than disorderly conduct because it kind of just sounds like a jobber gimmick. Oh, I like you know? it. I like it. Do you? Okay. Well, I do. I do. I think you might be one of the few people that do, but I appreciate it, Carl. You're the best. I mean, you're the WCW aficionado. I mean, come on. Um, there seems like high voltage and, you know, I love high voltage. I love high voltage. I think you? it's a great name. It sounds, it sounds lame. It's a name, lame name, but. <laughs> just so you know, high, high voltage in the back, everybody called them high dosage. Oh God, I can imagine. Yeah, I, and I you know Robbie Rage had a had a bit of a problem. Yeah, gas gas to the gills, and they were terrible. The, the, the first time we worked them, they were one of our first tapings. He's telling me how to take a clothesline, Robbie. <laughs> oh he goes, God. when you take a clothesline, make sure you hit back and all that. Not realizing I had been in endless been territory. Yeah, you know. And then they went out there with us, and then afterwards, he's like, "Okay, I didn't realize you had been in business as long." But that's just kind of the guys they were. Nice guys, right. but just mentally blah but it was cool doing those tapings we got to wrestle like a lot of the international guys like la parka and psychosis uh ray you know there's just so many international guys we got to work with 
but yeah, bottom line, bottom line is, is with that ter- with, with with that time period. Um, what was the question you were asking me about? Oh, uh, how how disorderly conduct became a thing. Oh yeah. So what happened is, is Terry said, "Come up with some names." So we, Tom and I, got together and we figured some things out. We came up with a bunch of different names, and he liked disorderly conduct. So then we decided on what outfits we wanted, and we just tried to be as creative as we could with the jackets and all that. And, yeah, did the best we could. I mean, it, it was what it was. We already knew we were jobbers at that point, and um, you know, it was presented. But we were under contract at that point. We were just happy to get that every two weeks, get that payday, and that's how me and Mike and Tough Tom came about. And it was it was cool. But again, Tough Tom, you know how he always gets the billing on Wikipedia? Yeah. They decided to come up with WCW trading cards. Guess who gets a card? Uh, don't tell me he got you. He got a card and you did. He got, Are you serious? A tough card on eBay right now for about thirty cents, and I don't have any. Wait, when did Tough Tom break into the business? He was trained by the same guy I was, but many years later, I was trained in like eighty two. He was probably trained in like eighty eight. Um, but because we ran in the same circles, we knew of each other and all that. And he actually was a job. There's, there's a match on AWA where he was a jobber for Bull and I as the hangman. He was Tom right. Bennett. He was oh just a jobber, not knowing he was going to be a hangman eventually. But that, that's how that's how that worked out. And eventually he got picked, like I said, and, and it went from there. And then he became Blackjack Bennett, Puerto Rico. I did my yeah. Kodia. And uh, that was it. But yeah, so strange how it always seemed to work out where I always got the raw end of things, <laughs> even though... Tr- when it comes down to a bull pain and I were the, were the original hangman and I was an original, I've been in a hangman for 30 years. You must have hate with someone with Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> I think just, so. <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. I'm just, it's, it's becoming more and more comical to me as this interview goes on. He actually has his own article for himself. There's one for oh. disorderly conduct, but there isn't one for you. And listen to this. Oh, there is one for disorderly conduct. There, there is one. It's very brief. Oh, um, there's I didn't one that, for him. But, but I have a friend of mine named Dave Hero, who's a promoter in Milwaukee or Wisconsin. Does a lot of big shows. Apparently, he's got something to do with Wikipedia, too. And many years ago, he had said that he would write something up for me, too, because he knew there was some discrepancies. He sent it in, and they said that I didn't qualify to be a Wikipedia person. Yet both my partners were in there. You know, Scott Hudson doesn't have one either. It's crazy. That, that, that goes on. It's, there's so many it's people who have done so much less that have an article. Well, maybe, maybe Carl, you'll be the guy that'll get I'll things straight. I'm going to get awesome. it done, brother. I would love um, that. Okay, so early on in WCW, you're working with Harlem Heat, the Faces of Fear, Doc Dean, and Robbie Brookside. Early on, um, you're doing the Saturday night taping, so that's once every two yeah. weeks. It would. It was all actually done in a weekend. Okay. We would go there maybe Saturday and Sunday, and they would do a, sh- I mean, like ten tapings. Right. Okay. And then, and you'd be in the dressing room. There'd be, as far as you could see, there were stars and and workers. You'd see the, you know, Davy Boy and Nightheart. This, I mean, there was just everybody was there, and you would just work whoever they they, they had a chalkboard, and they would just put on the thing who you were working. You'd go find the guys you were supposed to work. It it would say eight minutes or whatever, and you'd figure out your stuff and go out there and do it and. It was pretty cool. And then the nice thing is, is you'd stay over in Orlando and then that night it'd just be like party city and everyone having fun. And it was cool. I was going to say, like, I would imagine that once all that's done, finally, you know, after all the tapings, everyone would go out and, and uh, yeah. get on the source. It, a little bit. Saturday nights when after a taping, it was, it was crazy. It was people everywhere. And there'd be like certain, you know, clicks. So it'd be guys here and then pretty much the whole city of Orlando was infiltrated with just wild wrestlers having fun. It was great. That's cool, man. Um, and Lenny and hung out a little bit, but at that time we really we were just starting to get close. Yeah, we got much closer later on. Um, but yeah, we were starting to get pretty close at that time. But I always hung out kind of pr- primarily with whoever my partner was because we didn't indulge in a lot of that. And neither did Lenny. But we didn't indulge in any of the drugs or any of the heavy stuff. We were just drinkers. Yeah. Tom likes to smoke pot like crazy, but we never did the stuff that some of the guys did. Thank God. You, you weren't a Perry Saturn and a Raven type team. or Yeah, or any of those guys. Yeah, a lot of them just indulged too much. Uh, so this must have been a bit of a thrill in a way. Uh, November 24th, 97, World Tag Team Championship match against the Steiner Brothers on Monday Nitro. What was it like working with the Steiner Brothers on Nitro? 
It was intense. Those guys, we had wrestled them on the Saturday night show too, and they were physical. And they weren't really that friendly. They were like, like it's weird because when I talked to Marty, he's like, oh, those guys are the coolest guys ever. But to us, they were nice, but they were very business. And then you kind of always felt when you went out there, you didn't know what was really going to happen. And they were very physical. And what happened is if you watch the match, Scott goes to pick up Tom for that finish where he does the thing on the shoulders. Yeah. And for whatever reason, just our luck, Tom's tights get caught on Scott's forehead. Oh, no. And he can't get him up all the way. And then he finally gets him up and he flips him over. But then when we get back, Scott's like, hey, next time you better make sure you get your ass up. It wasn't even our fault. But yeah, yeah, they were rough. They were rough guys, but but it was cool. It was a great opportunity. Um, we only got to do a couple of nitros. We did a lot of thunders. Yeah. Um, I remember one time I wrestled, uh, it was supposed to be me and Tom against Steve Regal and Dave Taylor on nitro in uh, Long Island. And then Sid came up though, before the match and just have all the shit all the yeah. yeah. I have that written down for later on. Um, but yeah, no, uh, uh, you guys certainly did a good favor for Sid as well um, in a handicap match. But uh, I want to talk about uh, still in 97 ish. Uh, you're working with Darso and John Nord, the public enemy, uh-huh. the Vianos, Mike Enos and Wayne Bloom, Eaton and Bobby Walker, High Voltage. And I want to say not one win for disorderly conduct. Um, and as a fan watching, and my friend Kevin agrees, we get behind you both, or we got behind you both as we were watching these shows the years later after they happened. We just wanted to see you guys pick up a win. What you was know what? Like, we would like um, to... Yeah, we would like to see. And I appreciate you thinking that way. Um, the only time we ever won on TV was against the Volanos and uh, the Armstrongs. Um, they, we were jobbers for the most part, like but but, but under contract jobbers, and um, we wanted more. But here was the problem: once you set that precedent of who you are, it's really hard to get out of that. Yeah, Do you know what I'm saying? Like like with the difference between us and Lenny is Lenny had done a few jobs where he, he wasn't a perennial jobber. Like we were, we literally came in there as jobbers and we just stayed jobbers. And even though we probably should have spoke up more looking back, one of the regrets I have too, is we probably should have spoke up more to Nash or Sullivan or whoever was the booker at the time, but half the time you didn't even know who the booker was. Yeah. And, you know, it just is what it is, but we were just happy to be there. Unfortunately, the guy who trained us, had been a jobber most of his career and he kind of taught us to just be happier there and don't bitch. And we kind of had that mentality and looking back, I wish we would have spoke up more. I think maybe we deserved at least a little run. Yeah. But, um, it was what it was. I mean, we, we did what we did and we were happy to be there. And, um, you know, it was just cool to travel around the country and, and wrestle these different guys. And we got to wrestle a lot of different guys. I got a story about Ray Mysterio. If you want to hear it. Yeah, sure. All right, so um, on a Thunder, it was Ray. No, actually, it was a Saturday night taping. We did Thunder after. So it was Ray and Eddie Guerrero against me and Tom as disorderly conduct in Rome, Georgia. And I don't know what happened, how this happened, but for whatever reason, I was at, I was in the corner, and I was supposed to get tagged in. And for whatever reason, Ray came flying over, and he hits me with his forearm, and he hits me right in the mouth. Now, there was no heat. Ray's a yeah. great guy. It was just, a, it was just an excitable. T- I don't know what happened. Yeah. Point being, he knocked all my teeth backward. Oh shit. Yeah. And it was a hard form, but it wasn't heat because I know Ray and I worked with him before. It wasn't like that. So he hits me, and then all of a sudden I get the tag from Tom. You can see this. I think this one's on YouTube. And now it's Eddie and I, and Eddie's hit, doing his stuff, and I'm like Eddie, I go my teeth are. I think my teeth are knocked out. And he's like, what? And so we start talking a little bit and we eventually go home. When I get back to the dressing room and my front, all four of my front teeth are bent. This oh my way. gosh. Wow. Yeah. And it didn't hurt that bad, which was really weird. Um, and then they, they always had a doctor. Every WCW show, there was always a, a doctor or a trainer that would analyze things. And he comes up and he looks and he says, those, those aren't fixable. You're going to have to get new teeth. What? Now keep in mind, I always had a gap in my teeth to the point where I was always conscious of even smiling because really? I had a big gap in my teeth. So I'm like, so you're saying I'm getting new teeth? And he goes, yep. And I'm like, ching. I'm happy, actually, because <laughs> I'm going to get these teeth. So um, 
the next day I went to a dentist and they removed all those. And they just, at the time they had to put like, they had to do like a molding. Yeah. So the funny thing is, is the next day is thunder. It was Kidman and Ray. And that's on YouTube against me and Tom. I don't have any teeth. I've just got a mouthpiece in. That's like a blank screen thing. It's weird. Right. And we did the match and it was great. But then guess what? I flew up to Atlanta like two other times. And now, you know, all these years later, I've got a nice set of pearly whites. I smile all the time. I said to Ray afterwards, he goes, he was almost crying in the dressing room. He's like, I'm so sorry I did that. And I'm like, dude, I get a new set of teeth out of this. I just want to thank you. And later on, when I got the teeth, I go, thanks, Ray. Praise great. the Lord. Thank the Lord for Ray Mysterio yeah. Jr. and his overzealous forearm. <laughs> Ray, thank you very much. You've changed my life. And he did. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. Thanks for that story. Um, so, okay, where am I at? So, yeah, you know, we, we want to see you guys get a win. And, 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 and there's times later on where you guys are losing matches to tag teams that aren't even really a tag team. They're just a thrown together tag team like exactly. Vincent and Stevie Ray and, and uh, you know, a bunch of others that weren't going to be sticking around as a team. Like um, and that big swallow with... and Brad Armstrong. I yeah, mean, not even... that sucks, yeah. man. Like, it was terrible. That's a shit. And uh, Brad Armstrong's fantastic, but that group she was, was amazing. a waste of time. They're not even taking Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and there is a time period of time in WCW where they're not doing anything with the tag team titles. I think like they're just vacated for a long time and they do a thing with Rick Steiner and uh, I guess Judy Bagwell was tag champ technically. And then um, he picked uh, Kenny chaos to be his tag partner, which obviously yep. that also went nowhere. And it's I'm thinking, weird time. why don't you put the belts on one of those teams that have been there for years like a high voltage, like a disorderly conduct. They're there. You're not doing anything. Just just put it on them and have it defended on Saturday night until you're ready to finally bring it back onto Nitro Dude, and Thunder. It's amazing to even hear that people thought that because I would never thought anyone did think that, but it's really a good thought because why not reward somebody who's been there forever paying their yeah. dues since you're not really doing anything with anyone anyways? Exactly. But they never did. But, but, but remember, we spoke briefly before the show even began the Eric Bischoff story where he didn't even know who the hell we were. Yeah. Tell that story. Yeah. So we're in, we're under contract at this point for probably two years, but we had been with them, been with WCW for at least four years. And one of the nasty boys got hurt. So they asked us to do the swing around the loop when they were doing house show still. And it was against Ming and Barbie and it was us against them. And we were in the San Francisco cup palace. And Arn was the agent at the time. And he called us afterwards by him. And he goes, you're not going to believe this. And I'm like, why? What's up? And he goes, Eric came up to me. He happened to be there for whatever reason. And he goes, man, those guys, he said to Arn, he goes, those guys are hell of a hands. He goes, what's the story with those guys? And Arn's like, they've been under contract for <laughs> two years and been with us forever. <laughs> he goes, wow. He goes, pretty good. He had signed our contract, which I still have to this day. He didn't even have any idea who we were. Yeah, yeah, he was our, our announcer in AWA, too. So who knows? <laughs> it's insane. It is insane. Um, That's scary. Uh, late 98, there's a handicap match between Disorderly Conduct and Scott Hall. The giant is nowhere to be seen. I want to talk about this because I just watched it today. Uh, I, I know I'd seen it before because I've been watching everything chronologically with WCW from... 95 up until I'm up to about uh, April of 2000 right now. Um, so I've seen everything, uh, but you take a fucking outsider's edge like I've never seen before. Um, tell me about what happened there. We weren't very happy about getting that. I mean, you know, it's one thing doing jobs for a tag team, but when you got to do a job for one guy, even though he's big, it sucked. But you know what? We were under contract and we're like, at this point, does anything really matter? just collecting a payday and being happy to be here. So the thing I didn't like about it though, is, you know, keep in mind, Scott and I had a lot of history in the 80, remember the rib thing I told you about? Yeah. With that friend of mine, I knew him in the AWA and we didn't even get into it, but in Puerto Rico, when Bull and I were the champions, Scott used to come in all the time. This is well before his run with WCW, you know, and he was Scott Hall. 
and he used to, we used to let him drive with us because we had a rental car that we paid 700 bucks a month for, and he didn't have a car because when you come in and out, you don't usually get a car. We would let him drive with us and him and I would go and eat at Bonanza Buffet together. I, I had a lot of history with Scott. But when it came time for that match, barely wanted to talk. He was starting to get influenced on the drugs and all that back then. Yeah. But he barely wanted to talk to us. He was rude. He just beat the shit out of us. He was rough. I made sure I laid that elbow in when I laid it in, though. But bottom line is, is it was a, it was a rough match, and he did take care of us on the finish, which I'll say. But he could have been a little more professional about it. But later in years, he did apologize and say, you know, you know, I, I could have been better about that. But it was what it was. Yeah, fair enough. But I, I will say you two did a fantastic job in making him look good, despite how you might have felt. <laughs> a fantastic like, job, no point in it. You were both just laying, <laughs> laying there. Take, both took the finish, and then, you know, yeah. I and just, and, and they, did, they did say to us, it was for a pay-per-view that was coming up, whatever it was, and they're like, listen, please go out there and make him look like a million bucks. So that's what we did. It's our job. Early 1999, uh, me and Mike, uh, there's a WCW World Tag Team title tournament. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this is a perfect opportunity for a team like Disorderly Conduct yeah. to make it to at least the semifinals. Uh, were you hopeful that this would lead to a bigger spot as they obviously needed tag teams at the time and you guys were a tag team under contract on television for several years at that point? Were you hopeful that they might be like, okay, no, to be honest, at that point, we already kind of figured that they just lost interest in us. Um, we were there to collect a paycheck. You know, our biggest supporters were always Jimmy Hart, Terry Taylor, and Arn Anderson. Now, Jimmy Hart, you know, he's not a wrestler, but you, whenever you have supporters that are agents, usually you can judge by why they're supporting you. And Arn and Terry were great workers. Yeah. And the reason they supported us is because they knew we were pretty good workers, too. But, you know, they're not the powers that be. And we didn't we didn't have any thought we'd be in it. And, of course, we weren't. We really didn't. At that point, we knew we were just getting a payday and that was it. But I will say one thing, and J.J. Dillon told me this when we finally did get our notice. They kept us on because of their respect for our work a long time. Right. Um, I wanted to bring this up because uh, I'm not sure if you remember it, but... Uh... On the 3rd of February, 1999, WCW Saturday Night Disorderly Conduct defeat Chuck Palumbo and Mark Gingerak at the Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Do you remember working with those young guys? I remember working the match. Did we go over? Apparently. Well, I don't remember that, but yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah. I remember because Chuck was fairly seasoned, but he still wasn't that great, but he was okay. But Mark Gingerak... Nice guy, but he was so high strung and so intense about that match. I remember sitting down. He was literally running around the ring during that match. He was insane. I mean, the guy, he was a nice guy, but he was just out of his element, high strung, and we were just happy to get that match done with. He was a nice guy, but it was just, it's just, that was a perfect example of how they would push guys because of their bodies or their look and not even care about their work ethic. I mean, not the work ethic, but their work, you know, their experience. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so the 16th of March, which is uh, 14 days later, you two defeat the Armstrongs on television. Uh, and I think Scott Hudson even said, I think this might have been the first time Disorderly Conduct's won a match here on Saturday night. Um, working with the Armstrongs, tell me about that, because e almost every person I've had on the show has just sung the highest praises of any of the Armstrongs, whether it's Steve, Scott, Brad, or Brian. Yeah. Great guys. Um, we worked with Scott and Steve a lot. Sometimes they won. Sometimes we won. They were amazing guys, class acts, gentlemen, cool dudes, tremendous. And then I got the opportunity to work with Brad one time when it was Brad and that swell. And that was a nitro and um, with me and Tom. And like everyone else says, when you get in the ring, with, when, you, when you got in the ring with Brad, you knew you were in there with a special animal. That guy was smooth and as good as you. he was like Kurt. Yeah. When you were in with him, you just knew it was a little different. It was that good. Um, August 5th, 
Wisconsin for Thunder. Uh, handicap match against Sid. Made him look like a million dollars. Any story behind that one? Well, the one cool thing was is I actually got to talk a little bit. And remember, I took the microphone out and yeah. I saw that, which was all part of their deal. So that was cool. But um, it, Sid was Sid was not a pleasant guy to work with. He wasn't. He was very rough. He would literally go way overboard to be so stiff with you. He would always set you down decently for the finish. But he was so gassed up and so intense. He just, he was not a good guy to work with. I don't care what, I mean, I'm sure a lot of guys would say that, but especially if you're a jobber, he was, he was, he was not a night off, put it that way. You know, he was rough, but we never got, you know, here's the thing. If you, if you, if you can make it to a match, even if you get your ass kicked, but you don't have to worry about injuries afterwards, then it's still pretty good. You know, but it's funny because there's guys like Chris Benoit, Fit Finley, guys that look like they'd kill you. Yeah. That were a day off. They were snug, but they were a day off because they were that good. Tell me a little bit about working with Lenny and Lodi. Oh, geez. Uh, it was fun. You know, Lenny is great, underrated, should have been pushed more, truly still maybe to this day he has a run in him. I mean, he's great. And he's one of my best friends. I mean, we've done a lot together. Lodi, I don't know as well. Lodi wasn't as good as Lenny. I'm sure he would even say that. Um, but together they were a great tag team and they did, did some good things. I think they should have been pushed more. I think that, that, I think that all the stuff that came up kind of hampered their push, but they were, they were, they still, they stood out to me. I agree. I was a big fan. Um, you spent the rest of 99 working uh, with the West Texas Rednecks, Conan and Ray, Harlem Heat, Brian Nobbs and Barbarian. Um, oh. <laughs> you got any stories of uh, working with those teams? I mean, are you talking uh, about Ray, but. Barbie and Ming were like Benoit and fin- Finley where everything was so- Stan Hansen too. These were guys that were all so solid like to the point where it was almost borderline fighting but yet they were so good that they took care of you and it was just great um knobs and sags i love those guys i mean they live here they both live here in clearwater where i live but they were uh they were you know they want the smoothest guys and they were a little rough and sloppy but they made a lot of money so who am i to judge <laughs> um i want to get we're getting towards the tail end here now uh, sure mike uh WCW in 2000, you guys are working with the Mamelukes, Three Count, Crowbar, and David Flair, the Harris brothers. Um, this is kind of like the, the the last, you know, part of the run that Disorderly Conduct have in WCW. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you find out that WCW, night, WCW Saturday Night is getting cancelled, what did you and Tom think? Um, we knew the end was coming. Everybody knew the end was coming. It was just a matter of when you were getting your notice. And like I said, for us, thank God, knock on wood, we were one of the, literally one of the last contract employees to get released. And the reason being is when I talked to JJ, when he called us, uh, they just had a lot of respect for our work and they wanted to do the best they could for us for as long as they could. Um, But it was, it was coming. We all knew it. Everybody, every week we were hearing more and more guys getting laid off. It was coming to the end. And I think we were like the third last cut, which, being really? jobbers, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Because um, I wanted to say, uh, this is interesting to me that now you mentioned this. March 15th, you lose to Lane and Rave, which is Lenny and Lodi, for your final appearance on Saturday night. Um, and your final televised appearance uh, after that is on March 29th, and it's a loss to Harlem Heat 2000 on Worldwide in Beaumont, Texas, against okay. uh, Ahmed wow. Johnson and uh, Stevie Ray. Uh, and then nothing else happens after that until a dark match, which I'm going to talk about later. But um, were you aware that that was your last televised appearance at the time? And why weren't you brought back? We weren't aware then. We just thought it was just another taping. And it was so strange because if you're talking about the dark match with the Shane twins. Yeah. Yeah. They brought us all in on the premise that, you know, um, we were really just there to see if they wanted to hire. Okay. 
Sorry, hang on a second. Uh, I've lost your audio here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that, but I don't know what happened. Neither do I. That's okay. We're can still ready that or no? Everything's okay. Um, let's just go back to where we're at. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, that uh, dark match with the Shane twins, um, and then I had lost your audio at that point. So um, yeah. let's just. So back. so so the strangest thing is, is the Shane twins and I. It's so funny because we're all bouncers at this place in in Ybor City called uh, oh, right. the Empire. Yeah. And can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, so anyway, so we all we were tight friends, and they got the call that they wanted to do a tryout. And I'm thinking to myself, this company's closing soon. Why are they doing a trial? Yes. Well, we were happy to it and we did it. They put us over, which was weird too, but I think they were just testing those guys. But anyways, we did the tryout. And then it's funny because I wanted to get a tape of that. So I, I uh, contacted Johnny Ace because he was an agent at the time. And he lived right down the street from me, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I went to his house and I picked up the tape and I asked him, I go, what was that all about? And he goes, who knows? He goes, you know, this company and he gave me a tape of it. So I have that tape to this day, but bottom line is, is that's just a perfect example of the, the dysfunctional WCW. Right. Yeah. Um, Having a tryout match probably a month before you close. Yeah. Isn't that stupid? Um, stupid. But after, you know, I wanted to scale back to that Harlem heat 2000 match in Beaumont. Uh, what were you two thinking when uh, were you still making that phone call to hear if you were booked or not after that? Or did anyone tell you why it was such a long time from March 29th until um, March 19th, what 2001? Is, what happened is, is after that tryout match, we didn't hear anything. And we knew they were closing soon. It just wasn't going good. And then I just got a call from JJ Dillon one day and he said, please call me back. And I called him and he said, Hey, I got to let you guys go, but we did keep you on as long as we could because of all the hard work you did for us over the years. And we were like the third to last cut. And I said, thank you very much. He goes, you know, it's refreshing to hear that. He goes, cause a lot of guys are complaining. I go, Hey, we're just thankful that you, you paid us as long as you did. And that was it. And then, and, uh, was there ever yeah, any mention as to why you hadn't been on television since the uh, previous year? Since the what? Since like uh, that match that you guys had with Harlem Heat 2000. Uh, was there? No, any... they didn't mention anything, but it wasn't uncommon. There were times we went, shit, there were times when we were under contract that we, for a month or six weeks, we wouldn't get any work. And we just consistently got that two week paycheck. So I mean, there was just, just right. so many guys and so much going on. Yeah, no, we weren't. That that didn't surprise us at all, you know. And then when we got a last check, that was it. And the company closed shortly after that. And you know, it was it was a, it was a good time. I mean, I wish it would have been better, but it was. We were happy that it happened. How did you find out WCW was going under? Uh pretty much the same way everyone did on <laughs> when we watched Monday night. And you know, it just. I mean, I'm sure there were guys that were more in the privy that knew already, but for me, I didn't know. We were still waiting to see if we we're going to get bookings in the next couple of weeks. And then we saw the Monday night show and we're like, okay, I guess that's it. Yeah. Shit. And a lot of us were like that. They didn't, they didn't, you never got a phone call. It was always listening to the recording to see if you were booked or whatever. It was very rare. You got a phone call. Uh, Lenny did a little more than we did, but we were really just basically, you know, not enhancement town, but we were, we were just utility guys and they didn't really feel the need to communicate with us much. Um, yeah. But at the same time, if someone's paying you a decent paycheck every week or two weeks, you know, you take it and you do what you got to do. Uh, we ask everyone this, and there's not many questions left, uh, me, Mike, uh, but uh, we ask everyone about what their thoughts are on how badly the WWF botched the invasion angle. The mm. What are your thoughts that on that whole thing? Horrible. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think, and I'm sure a lot of guys think that too. I think that could have been huge. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think that could have been huge? That could have gone on for years. They didn't need to blow their load in six months. They needed to just take their time with it. You know, wait till some people's contracts ran out with AOL Time Warner and slowly bring some of those bigger guys in, bigger stars in, you know, bigger names. And, you know, it, it the, the scenario that, you know, I would want to do would, you know, probably wouldn't be what some others would do, but, you know, I would start it slow with um, having uh, P 
people show up every now and then asking Vince for a job and him keep saying no to all these guys. And then, you know, eventually uh, people are being attacked in the back after weeks and weeks and you don't know who's doing it. And then one week, let's say, I don't know, Kurt Angle's laid out in the back and Kurt Angle's in pain and he rolls over and there's the NWO spray paint on his back, you know, and then, you could just start it off with those guys and have it not even be about WCW. It's just about the NWO coming in. And then eventually something with Bischoff coming in to promise WWF that he would, you know, sort out the NWO. If, you know, if you sign me, I'll make sure that these guys don't ruin the company. And well, whilst he's under contract, he's also finding a way to get all of his boys in WCW signed. And then all of a sudden everyone's under contract and, and uh, it's all a screw job for Vince, but that was that's just one idea I have as a fan of wrestling. Um, that's, actually, I, that's a great that's that's good stuff that should have been done. I don't mind. Slow burn, you don't need to just do it. Just Sean Stasiak is not representing W, he was in WWF like a year prior. Why is he one of the main people for exactly? Lance Storm was in ECW and he's the first person that shows up on Raw to uh attack someone Terrible. like. Lance is great, but Lance was an ECW guy and he was in WCW for what, like seven months? Like, just right. to me, like, it's just, it was just mishandled completely. Those are all great points. I mean, the bottom line is, had they done what you did, might have been one of the biggest things they ever did. But I think his ego, he just wanted to crush WCW. But it's sad because it had so much opportunity and, you know, it was ego driven, I think. I mean, what else could it be? Like, you, it has to be. you had, I'm sure other people must have had something similar. You're leaving money on the table, but for ego, a shitload. A shitload. My God, can you imagine? Okay. Anyway, cool. I'd love to see it. Even as a worker, I would have loved to see that. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk about quickly XWF. You were uh, brought in to work with Big Vito on one of the tapings. Uh, were you uh, hopeful that that was going to be a uh, a thing yeah that was the league that uh jimmy hart had a lot to do with um yeah. they had like the round system it was kind of a weird funky concept and they were going to give everyone contracts blah 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 and it was based out of tampa um it was all right i mean it, it just it just was not realistic they just had too many expectations for something that wasn't going to work and you know like anything else i mean trying to compete with the bigger leagues is just not that t- possible and it faded out quickly and the Jimmy Hart's and some of the other guys, they got their paydays for whatever weeks, you know, and then it just stopped. And just like uh, AWF, yeah. a lot of these guys, they get involved with these people who have money and they convince them to do X and O and those people spend the money and, and those guys just collect paychecks. They're not detrimental to them, but the bottom line is, is it, there's, the, the expectations are not realistic. Yeah. I, th- I think the one thing I liked about, cause I'd got the DVD of the XWF lost tapes and I liked uh, Sable being the commissioner because if she were to yeah. tell me what to do, I would do it and I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah. She got Brock <laughs> Lesnar to do what he wants. She wants to do. So I'm pretty sure she um, can get us all to do what she wants to do. I'm sure. Um, this is yeah. an interesting one, Mike. Uh, a WWF house show in Tampa, Florida on the March on March 1st, 2002, there is a dark match with yourself mm-hmm. against Bubba the Love Sponge with Gerald Briscoe uh-huh. as the special guest referee. How the hell did this happen? All right. So I'm going to make this brief, but it's a really good story. So Bubba the Love Sponge and I met up in Milwaukee. He's a DJ. Are you familiar with him at all or no? Yeah, no, I, I know. I know of him from oh, him. Okay. Being in so he has a radio so. show. He's pretty, he was a big syndicated guy. He used to be on Howard Stern station, blah, blah, blah. So him and I met in Milwaukee. He wasn't in the business at the time, but he always wanted to be. So I had a wrestling school back then. I trained him briefly. He moved down to this area where I live in Clearwater, Florida. And he said, if you come down here, I'll put you in charge of running my nightclub, which was called, um, um, you know, it was it was Planet Bubba. Okay. So I came <laughs> down here because why wouldn't I want to run a nightclub named Planet Bubba and yeah. wrestle? and be in charge of the whole building when, you know, the opportunities could be endless. So I come down here and uh, it's great. And we were friends and all that. And it eventually evolved to where 
he got this opportunity because of his status on the radio to do this. We did actually two shows. We did one for WWE. It was him and I in a singles match with Briscoe. And we actually pulled off a really good match. And then we also wrestled for WCW. It was him and Hacksaw against me and Tom as the hangman. And that was in the same building, the, the big building down in Tampa. And, um, you know, he, he was good as long as he was working with me because I taught him. Yeah. That's cool, man. So, like, uh, what was it like being in the, the WWF locker room of that, sh- that house show? Um, it was okay, but I had been on, you know, when I was, even Mike Richards, I had done house shows against Kurt and different guys as a jobber. And, you know, I, I had done a lot of house shows for both groups over the years. So, it was cool. I mean, it was just another booking, to be honest with you. The yeah. cool thing was it, was it was here in Tampa. So, a lot of my family and friends, not my family so much, but friends would be there and, um big houses both of them were packed i mean it was it was it was pretty cool that way and i got to call into a show building up to it like for oh, weeks cool. yeah hangman, my voice and all that and <laughs> it was pretty cool it was a good build up cool man um so is it true your final match was may 31st 2013 against a man known as larry huntley i don't know who that is Okay, so again, the internet has screwed me over once again. Uh, so, Hunter, Larry Huntley. Oh, I, I've never even heard of that name. No, where was that at? Supposedly, uh, it's on cagematch.net. Uh, I'll have to be even... no, I mean, where was it supposed to take place? Do you know? Um, let me just you know what it could be, too. There were other as, as the years went on, there was a team like in Alabama or something that started calling themselves the Hangman. But they were like one guy was tall and skinny and the other guy was fat and short and they were nothing like us. And there's some YouTube videos of them guys. So it could be maybe that was them. I don't know. Said uh, Larry Huntley defeats Mean Mike at UFO Wrestling in Somerville, Massachusetts. Maybe yeah, that maybe must be someone a else called Mean Mike. Mike. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot of Mean Mikes like Mike, me and Mike Enos. By the way, me and Mike Enos lives here by me. I saw him. It's funny. I'm a, I'm a real estate appraiser now, and I have a real estate business, uh, appraisal business. And I was on an appraisal, and as I'm pulling up to the house, I see Mike Enos. I'm like, what the hell? Because we go way really? back, you know, from the construction crew days and all that. And he's got a painting business down here. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And it was just so weird randomly that he'd be at the place I was. He was painting the same house I was appraising weird uh, i'll tell you something that's amazing that you've mentioned that i have emailed his painting business asking if i can interview him and i've never had a reply um yeah i i, I, I would, would think love that to be with him he's not a talker at all like literally and i've known him for 30 years i mean we go way back i mean he was a jobber when i was a jobber in awa um he's a nice guy but he's just not a talker Okay. And his son and his son works for him as a painter too. And his son looks just like him. It's really weird. They look like twins. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope he's doing well. And um, but yeah, that's just another guy that I really wanted to eat. Uh, so anyway, as far as that guy goes, that wasn't my last match. My last match okay. was I mentioned a little earlier, Dave Hero. He was a promoter who runs this show called Blizzard Brawl every year in December in Milwaukee. And and he he's one of the best promoters out there. He actually usually draws almost 2000 fans for that wow, show. And he brings big. a lot of big, yeah, for an indie, right? Yeah. But he brings in a lot of big names. He's, his payroll is pretty big, but uh, in 2012, and you can see this on YouTube in 2012 was my last match, which is funny because I started in November 17th of, of 82. And my last match was sometime in 2012 in, in December. So it was basically 30 years. And um, I asked him, I said, is there any chance that you could book me and Tom and Bull oh. in the six man? Yeah, that's what I was about to just say. That would be a perfect. And that, and he did. Thank God. He's such a good dude. We're good friends. He brought them both in. Tom lived in Sheboygan, which is only an hour from him. But Bull lives down by me here in Clearwater. So we both flew up. And it was the first time ever. It was all three main hangmen together in a six man and they put us over and what a perfect way to end a career. Oh man, that's amazing. Partner. Yeah. So it was really cool. It was this now I will say this. None of us were at our peak by any means. Tom that's probably better though. than both of us, but it was watching was a little rough. And I knew after that, I even 
texted Dave afterwards. I go, man, I think I owe you a payday <laughs> because that was, I didn't look, to, you know, I, I'm, I'm older, I'm an older guy now, you know, and I just didn't move like I used to and bull couldn't move either hardly, but I mean, I shouldn't say hardly, but he couldn't move like we used to look. Yeah. But the guys we worked were great and they made us look good and we had a good match. And that was it. After that match, I said, I'm never wrestling again, you know, because you just get to a point where a lot of, you see a lot of these guys still wrestling and they just are shadow of themselves and I'm not knocking them, but I don't want to be that guy. You know, I'd well, rather I, I would like, I would like access to be able to watch that. If there's any footage of it to do what uh, I'd like to watch the match. If there's any footage of it, uh, it is. It's, 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 if you go to blizzard brawl, 2012, you'll see it. Okay. And you see what I'm talking that. about. Like, I literally had to help Bull take his vest off. I mean, we were we were just a little too old. And, you know, I'm 55 now. Back then, I was probably, you know, and physically, I feel like I, I look okay for my age. But when you're in the ring, when you haven't been in the ring, like at that point, I hadn't been in the ring in much in the last two or three years. Yeah. You're not in the ring it's a big difference. You know, it's, that's a, that's a special kind of training that you need. Um, you know, you can do all the cardio you want, but until you're in the ring, it's not the same. So I just, I just knew at that point I was done and I, I and I miss the business, but I don't, I don't ever want to be back in the ring because if I was to go back in the ring, I'd want to be able to perform at a level that I used to, and I can't do that, anymore, which is fine. 30 Absolutely. years is a long time. No, I understand. Um, I wanted to ask you about something uh, that I saw. Dallas Championship Wrestling. Are you involved in that? Dallas Championship Wrestling? I, 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 this is the internet again, I think. Well, I mean, I wrestled at the Sportatorium a lot, but that was for USWA. Right. I don't know what Dallas Championship Wrestling would be. Would that Was that something different that they... I, 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 just, I just heard that maybe you're involved in that. Maybe that's maybe I've, I've got that. The only Dallas stuff I ever did was all for Jeff Jarrett and Lawler. And that was, we did a lot of that, but it was never for any other company. That's the only time I ever was in Dallas for, for shows. Uh, but I was going to mention this too, um, if you don't mind, real yeah. quickly. I know we've been a long time. Um, I had thoughts like anyone else of hopefully going from jobber to under contract guy to maybe, maybe getting a push. I actually had three trials for WWF. Yeah. Yeah, I had one. Um, the first one was right after Bull and I split up. Um, when we got our notice from USWA because of the whole situation with him and that girl, I called J.J. Dillon. And at that point, we had had our run in Puerto Rico. And then we had our run in USWA with the straps. And we were in the top 10 in the Pro Wrestling Illustrated tag teams. And I called him. And literally, he put me to travel and booked us tickets right off the bat, which I was shocked. Yeah, but then when I called Bull to say, "Hey, do you want to go do these tryouts?" He was kind of getting involved with Samantha and all that, and he didn't really want to do that, and so I had to go on my own. So I, yeah. I as a Texas Hangman singly, I wrestled Coco Beware and Jim Powers for tryouts, but of course, as a single, didn't really mean a whole lot. I was just a mask guy, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but that's where I, that's where I met Johnny, though, which led to us going to Europe, which was great. And he was my taking partner. So something good came out of that. And then I had another trial with my partner, George, before Tom, uh, Sergeant Slaughter lined that up. And we just, we wrestled the Dups. Remember the Dups? I do. Yeah. Yeah. We wrestled the Dups and had a pretty good match, but nothing came of it. And then uh, the other trial I had was his Mighty Kodiak. When I was doing the Kodiak gimmick, I had a trial in Milwaukee against one of the guys I trained, Rambo Robinson. And so all three times, you know, they, they, I mean, to even get a trial, I think you got to be pretty good for them to even waste your time, you know, to, to do that. But all three times, it just wasn't in the cards. And, um, you know, I looking back, do I wish I would have done maybe a little more to try to get to that point? Probably. But at the same time, you know, 30 years and traveled all over the world and got to spin to Japan 10 times and all over Europe and Korea and all those other places. I'm, I'm just thankful I got to do what I did and meet so many cool guys. And you know what? it all works out the way it's supposed to. And um, I love my career. Put it that way. Oh, I'm happy to hear that, man. That, that it just, it, it means a lot to me to hear someone who's, who's had this long journey 
to be able to look back and be proud of what you accomplished. And um, very happy, be. very happy. And and it worked out good because now I have a real estate appraisal business and life is better than ever. I've got a beautiful girlfriend. Her and I live together. You know, I'm I look younger than I am, and I, life is great, man. And you know what? I would change a few things, but just to be in the business that you grew up and you love to get the opportunity. I won a lottery as far as I'm concerned. What was uh, your biggest regret? Um, hmm. Probably not speaking up a little more when we were in WCW. I think if we had gone to Terry or Kevin Sullivan or whoever and just said, hey, we got to maybe put together some ideas like Lenny did yeah. and presented them, I think maybe we would have got a little more consideration. But, you know, again, we were taught just be happy where you are and – don't make any waves. So that's probably my biggest regret. Would have led to anything? I don't know, but we probably should have tried. And uh, before I get to a little segment that I do to end the show, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, the best advice that you've been given in the business. So like a new wrestler or to just, just any time that you were in the business, the best advice that someone gave you. Um, be humble Listen more than you talk. Um, don't, you hear this all the time, from guys, but don't take unnecessary bumps just to try to, you know, if, if, if you need to take crazy bumps to get over, then maybe you need to analyze your work rate a little bit, um, you know, because that will catch up with you. Uh, I would say those would be the top three things. Just, you know, just, just try to get over as who you are rather than these crazy bumps, because guess what? The fans have seen everything nowadays. Yeah. There's no need to kill yourself. Well, once you've seen Ray Mysterio Jr. wrestle, you've seen everything. So, <laughs> um, but the, the the segment that I'd like to finish the show off on is five second points. Okay. And I know that with wrestlers, it's hard to answer a question sometimes in five seconds, but okay. this is just to get to know you a little bit better. Some are about wrestling, but others are just about you. Cool. Okay, five second frenzy, mean Mike from Disorderly Conduct and the Texas Hangman, aka the Texas Outlaws, number one, your favorite wrestler. Favorite wrestler? Yeah. Maybe Kurt. Your favorite opponent. Favorite, favorite what? Opponent. Ooh. Um, man, that's tough. I've had so many, you know, I got to wrestle Bob Backlund for 30 minutes for Windy City Wrestling. Wow. Really cool because I grew up as him as WBF champion. That was pretty awesome. That was Mighty Kodiak for that one. Yeah. Um, that would be cool. But then, man, honestly, I've had so many over 30 years. I can't think of anyone specifically that I would say. But I can tell you right now, some of the highlights were Stan Hansen and um, uh, Backland and um, Invader and Savio Vega, which was TNT, Carlos Colon, uh, Lawler and Jarrett, when we took the straps from them, that was a big deal. It's been just, it's just been so much. Um, so your favorite match, would that be another difficult <laughs> one to answer? That'd be tough, man. Yeah. It would just depend on the period of time because there's been so many different personalities I've had and so many different things. Um, I would say, I mean, honestly, I, I, I couldn't even say that's a great question, but I couldn't even say who specifically, but I will say this again, that Backlund 30 minute match was pretty stellar. I was really excited about that and it was, it, it went really well. And it was cool getting that atomic spine breaker from him at the end. <laughs> that was awesome. 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 Uh, your favorite TV show. Ooh, I'm almost embarrassed to say this. You know, I, let me say this first on a manly note. Thank you. I, uh, I love sports. I'm a, I'm a big sports guy, but if you look at my DVR, it probably thinks I'm a 40 year old chick. Cause I do like the bachelorette. <laughs> Don't judge me. Um, and some of those kind of reality shows, but my favorite show, I, I guess, would be probably um, just sports. I love UFC. I'm addicted to UFC. Anything UFC, I love. Cool. Uh, your favorite film? 
Brave art. Excellent. Your love favorite it. food? Mm, I love a lot of food, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> I would say probably a steak and a baked potato. Excellent. We always get steak, and, and steak is my favorite too. Yeah, nice. Uh, your favorite place to eat when you're on the road? Any kind of buffet, whether it be a country kitchen or a bonanza or whatever, because, you know, back in the day, I was pretty portly. I'm lighter now, but I like the buffets. Nice. We've just, in, in our state, Sizzler is closing down after many, yeah, many decades. Yeah, all closed here, too. Rest in really? peace. I love I, I just them, went. Yeah. I just went with my friends one last time on uh, Thursday, and yeah. we we used to do it like as like a, a once every couple of year kind of tradition. So we okay. had to go one more time, and it closes down in thirteen days. So wow! Um, shout did, out. Did you guys have ponderosas there or no? No, we don't. Like we don't, we don't have a lot over here. <laughs> Ponderosa is like the Jabra version of Sizzler, but I like them okay. both. Yeah. Okay. Um, your favorite alcoholic beverage? Uh, it used to be just a Mick Ultra beer, but now since my girlfriend and I are together, she's got me into vodka and anything else that goes with it that's drinkable, like Sprite Zero or Diet Coke or uh, Powerade or whatever. So that, that's, all the boys that's with your vodka. cocktail nights that you've been having. Yes. <laughs> vodka is like the big thing with the boys. Almost every guy I know works drinks vodka because it's the less calorie thing of all of them. Right. So you can drink more and not have to look like crap the next day. Yep. Uh, your favorite female body part? You know, I'm going to have to go with Lenny Lane. The vagina. <laughs> I mean, Brilliant. You know, I, I, I like, bre my girl's got some large breasts, which I love too. But the vagina is kind of where it all ends and begins. Yep. It's it's fun. Let's just say that. I mean, it is fun. <laughs> I know it's fun. <laughs> and the final one for Five Second Frenzy, Mean Mike, is your favorite curse word. Ooh. I'd have to go with fuck like probably most people do. That one really makes a statement. When you say fuck, it, it, it really kind of, you know, Damn, and all the other ones don't really fuck. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can say fuck in so many, so many instances. You stub your toe. Yeah. The, you stub your toe. It, it, the, can, the, it can be taken table. literally, or it can be taken like as a you know, fuck off, or fuck you, or fuck yeah. I mean, there's just so many ways you can use it. What's your favorite swear word? Oh fuck, absolutely. I mean, you you hurt your foot. You fuck. You put there your you penis go. in a vagina. Fuck. Wow, I like how you brought that all together. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, me, Mike. Uh, once I do the uh, the the uh, the end of the show, I would like to talk to you for at least two more minutes before yeah. we uh, sign off tonight. But um, what I want to say is, is that this show is really about the unsung heroes of professional wrestling, and I feel like you, Tough Tom. Paul Payne, you guys are unsung heroes in the wrestling business. You have done so much from 1982 up into 2012 when you had your final match. And still to this day, you're doing great things. But I really hope that even with any regrets that you have in WCW, that you look back and you've already said that you're proud of your, your career. But I really want Very you to know that. You were appreciated here in the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia, by at least myself and my friend Kevin. And I'm sure there are many others that, uh, and I've seen in many YouTube comments, people uh, praise disorderly conduct. So I hope you're proud of everything that you've done. Well, I appreciate that. And honestly, I appreciate the fact that you are such a wrestling historian that you do all your research and you, I mean, you know, endless amounts of wrestling and, and it's appreciated because you know what people like you who not only look at the stars, but look at the guys, you know, on top, middle and bottom, it's appreciated. Cause that's, that's really what it's all about. Bottom line is, is it's, it's all a collaborated effort. So yeah. Thank you for, uh, you know, the appreciation you have. That's okay. And you know what? Everyone from top to bottom is as important as one another, as far as I'm concerned, I Very don't care true. how much money you drew or how big of a star you were, or, you know, someone was in a position to 
book and write for people and certain people didn't get an opportunity that they deserved doesn't mean that they're not as important as those that were given those opportunities so that's uh my thing and let's face it when it comes down to it it's all about who they want to push you know you can either be a star or you can be a job or it's all about who they want to push so it's really not i mean it is about work rate and all that but bottom line is is that it's entertainment and it's really about who they want to push. So to judge anyone either way, you have to understand that, you know, they can only push so many guys. Yeah. And, and and for anyone out there that ever says anything about anyone like, Oh, that guy was just a jobber. Yeah. People who went one matches needed those guys in order to fucking mean something. So the jobbers, mean just as much as anyone else because they were there to help others and yeah they care what anyone has to say. Thanks, Carl. That's true. I mean it is it you know it's all relative. Bottom line is is we were all blessed to be in the business and you know what? It's just nice to know there's people out there that actually appreciate all the levels. So you know, but it was nice talking to you man. You man you this was the I've done two other podcasts, but by far this was the most in depth and most it was just it was just really a cool cool experience i, I wanted this it. to be the ultimate mean mike interview and the number one so the fact that i couldn't say that i've got that that means the world to me well thanks brother i appreciate it i want to hold on while you finish this up that's cool man and, and i wanted to ask if you wanted to send anything out there to any of your fans or anyone uh any final words or or, or if you want to like just plug anything that you're doing go ahead yeah i'm not really on social media and for all three of my fans one being you and the other two that might be out there um no i don't have anything to plug or anything like that i uh yeah i'm not in the business anymore so i just i don't really have i mean i got my own business now and all that and i focus on that um but i do appreciate whenever i uh look on my videos on YouTube or things like that and see people commenting and things like that. So, you know, I definitely appreciate it, but I'm really not involved with anything that I would need to push, but I appreciate asking. No worries, my friend. And, and I say my friend, because I really feel like through this conversation, we've become friends. I agree hundred percent. So thank you very much, me, Mike. And thank you to everyone that watched here tonight on the 55 live podcast here in conjunction with the WCWA network. I am California Fury and I'm very proud to say my new friend, Mean Mike from Disorderly Conduct. And I appreciate your time watching us here tonight and we will see you next time. Thank you.